Good evening, everyone. I just want to say um, thanks for coming down. We are waiting for our third member, um, Councillor Jourdain, to come to uh, create the quorum for us to begin the meeting. So I appreciate your patience in the meantime. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Um, I'd like to call to order the April 11th um, Committee on the City of, I'm sorry, <laughs> meeting on the Committee on Ordinance. Members present are uh, myself, I'm the Vice Chair, standing in for uh, Linda Vacan this morning, this evening. My name is Rebecca Lisi. Um, to my left, we have our um, City Council President, Kevin Jordan, and to my right, um, Ward Councilor David Bartley. Um, the first item on the agenda is the approval of the previous meeting minutes. I believe that we just received them tonight. Make a motion to keep those on the table. So moved. Um, and then moving on to item number two, which is a zone change application of Lascotti development for a zone change of 527 South Street from R2 to BG. Is there a motion to take this up off the table? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to take this up off the table. This is a continuation of the public hearing um, that began on... Sorry, about a month ago. I don't have the exact date. Um, we did get a communication from Lasati um, Development this evening, um, simply requesting that the um, public hearing be continued this evening, and I think we will recognize that request. However, um, you all made the trip down here tonight. Um, I know you all have a lot to say, and so um, I think we'll just launch right into the public hearing um, part of the um, item. and. Uh, I invite you all to the microphone to express your opinions. So um, when you come to the microphone, please state your name and address for the record. Should I make a motion to open the public hearing? You probably should. Sure. Yeah, I make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Record. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. So moved. <coughs> uh, thanks, uh, Brian, turn, turn the mic on. It's a knob on the top. You got it. There we go. It'd be easier for TV that one. Uh, hi, Brian Ramoth, 72 Carlton Street. Uh, thanks for having us here this evening. Uh, lots of members of the neighborhood uh, here with us. So um, we understand planning board uh, happened earlier this evening. Uh, I don't know if you know the vote on that. Um, from our understanding, the vote was no. Um, we are kind of upset that they have asked for a continuance considering the public has shown out. We feel that's kind of a move to try to get us to not show up. Just so you know, we're gonna keep coming. Uh, we do not uh, want this to uh, be moving, moving forward anymore. Uh, I did wanna uh, provide you guys, if I may, with a neighborhood petition that was signed by more than 100 residents of the neighborhood, uh, asking that this not be moved forward. Uh, so I don't know if I can provide this to you. Absolutely. Okay. I've always wanted to say this. Uh, may I approach the bench? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on in. <laughs> Thank you. There's also a note from a resident from uh, Wedgwood Terrace who was uh, not able, but she might actually be here. I'm not sure. So she is. So oh, okay, she great. Has a note she wrote as well, uh, kind of in, in against that. Um, so just to reiterate, we do not uh, want this to move forward. Um, kind of uh, Councilor Jardin and some of the other meetings we've been to and having heard you spoke, um, thinking about uh, best use for that location uh, for the neighborhood uh, and for our ward, um, pretty sure with a, a hundred people in that neighborhood uh, against it, uh, I think it's pretty clear uh, for, in our opinion as that residents of that, the, our opinion best use for that is, is not to have business in that location and to rezone that. Uh, so we do formally ask that you please uh, vote no on that. And thanks Thank very much. Thank you. Whoever wants to speak next, please just find your way to the microphone and then just state your name and address for the record. Sure. My name is John Gaughan and I'm from 12 Richard Eager Drive in Holyoke. I also own the two family that's on the corner of Russell Terrace and Carlton Street. Grew up on Carlton Street. Uh, house has been in the family for 80 years. Um, the house on uh, Russell Terrace we've had for uh, 28 years, lived there for more than 21. And uh, we really care about the neighborhood. In fact, uh, they always say, put your money where your mouth is. I spent over 30 grand to refurbish my two family. And uh, others have spent an awful lot of money in the neighborhood too. We think it's a transitional neighborhood in between downtown and uptown. And uh, when we hear about the proposal to change the business, uh, you know, as you know, over 100 people were willing to sign and the others are getting ready to sign, so there's going to be more. Uh, and also know that uh, <clears throat> there's a, a specific focus on getting, <clears throat> excuse me, um, <clears throat> more than 80% of the abutters within 300 feet of the property. 
I'd uh, love to see that, you know, developed with homes. Uh, there's a consideration for traffic, it always comes up, um, especially with the width of the street and with the current change to uh, two-way street. Uh, residents aren't really pleased with that. Learned that, uh, that PEC um, is being considered for perhaps an expansion or maybe even a middle school uh, expansion over there, so that would increase the traffic as well. And when you think about the winter conditions, it makes it even worse. But if we think about our friends and our neighbors, not only the residents, but the business people who already own auto parts stores, Advance, Cap, um, AutoZone, right within one mile, you know, how much business is there really? And so my question is, what type of a net benefit would there be to the city if another store comes in with competition? Sure, it's American dream, right? Free trade. But with the businesses that are struggling in the city today, I'm sure that they've already lost some percentage of business to Amazon Prime and uh, home deliveries. I don't think that long term, if there was to be another business that would put in there to take away from business of the others, we may end up with a new business, but we're probably not gonna have a fourth. One or two of the other ones are gonna go, we're gonna lose the revenue from them, plus the gas and electric and all the great things that come out of those businesses. So I feel very strongly uh, to request that you also um, vote no and to decline the request for a zoning change. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak this evening? I'm gonna speak at the risk of being the least popular person in the room. Um, my name is Deborah Aloisi. I live on 147 Sycamore Street. Um, and I've worked in addictions counseling for the past 10 years with the homeless population. I was at Russell Terrace, I was actually parking there. And I looked around the area and I kicked around the trash a little bit. It is less than pristine. It is not a place that anybody would want for a green space or for children to play. Um, and I have to ask, if, if not another business going in there, there must be something that has to be done with that place because this is part of urban decline when we allow things to go this far. Um, it doesn't take much to kick over the trash and see empty wax heroin bags, cocaine bags, cookers, tiny bottles of alcohol, and needles. And so many of my clients in the past have described spots like this that change um, from place to place when there's too many arrests in one part of the town. They find a bit vacant spot. So I, I, I have heard per people's concerns about um, drug activity in the area. I'd ask you to think about who you would want as your neighbor, an empty spot or a business that might even have some surveillance. Thank you. Uh, 95, uh, Jorge Diaz, 95 Westwood Terrace. I was going to speak, but I don't know what she's talking about, honestly. Um, that's a very open lot. A lot of people walk through there. There's no places to hide and do drugs. So I really don't know what you're talking about, just to let you know. Not just, I want to pick on you, but that's not real. And you can walk around that whole area. You can go by Peck and find that. You can go in other neighborhoods and find that in Holyoke. This is not just that area's problem. It's a city problem and uh, just trying to make it the problem of that lot, I think is unreal. That's all. Thank you. Hello, my name's Jonathan Michaels. I live at 84 Wedgwood Terrace. And um, my wife and I have lived there for about 10 years. We bought at the height of the market and then the crash happened and the home values went down but that isn't why we bought there it was a pleasant neighborhood that we could afford I've kept track on the only place I could Zillow.com for property values and our house according to them has come back to actually a little bit past what we paid for it when we moved there and is slotted, according to them, to increase by a further 8.7% in the coming year, which I think is somewhat remarkable. I have no doubt in my mind, however, that putting a business in that spot of that nature especially would uh, have a substantial negative impact on that because, as you can see, there are lots of people here who don't believe that's a desirable thing to have in the neighborhood. And I can understand putting 
making a zoning change in an area where it's understood and clear that it will bring the neighborhood up and benefit. I can understand making a zoning change for a neighborhood where it will make no substantial change to the value of people's investments. But to put a lot in a place where it will lower the value of people's investments it makes not very much sense to me. Whatever tax income might accrue from that property, which I can, is the only thing that I can see is the city's interest in this, uh, whatever might accrue would eventually be offset by the declining property values around it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Jane Kislow, 71 Carlton Street. I'd like to address the uh, trash issue. The neighbors and the uh, people in the neighborhood clean up. In fact, today when I got back from work this morning, there were empty uh, Burger King wrappers and everything, ketchup and stuff like that. That just happened to have been thrown out pre from between six and 10 o'clock in the morning. And as for any cans or beer bottles or anything, one of John Gaughan's tenants were out there on Saturdays or Sundays cleaning up the mess. So I really don't understand where uh, the trash is, where you're talking about. That's all I have to say. Hi, Jonathan Poutre, 573 South Street, uh, directly across from Jan's Flowers. I just want to uh, reiterate my point about the traffic. Uh, traffic is horrendous. It's impossible to get out of driveways on South Street. Um, last time I was here, 16 minutes to back out of my driveway at 3.30 in the afternoon. It's only going to get worse if you guys put in a store. Um, again, tra the trash, um, whatever's brought, been brought up, my issue with trash is the store. You get all the trash from the store, the cigarette wrappers, the lottery tickets, I have to come home every day and already clean my yard every day on a daily basis just from litter from the store across the street. They have one trash receptacle that's full by 10 o'clock in the morning. They don't change it till 11 o'clock at night when they're leaving. So if we're gonna talk about trash, it's only gonna increase. Um, but my point's the traffic, unsafe. That two-way street down there is absolutely horrendous. I can't believe somebody hasn't been hit already. Uh, again, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Kugler, 80 you Carlton the mic if you want. Bridget Kugler, 80 Carlton Street. Um, I again um, am opposed to the rezoning. Um, I've been on the street about 12 years. Um, the traffic already is awful. There is no way that um, Carlton Street is going to be able to absorb any more traffic. Already during peak hours, you cannot get out of the street. You can't go left. There, I don't know if anything could be done. Um, it's just, I don't see that it could get any better. And as far as Russell Terrace, the two-way, that was an awful idea. Absolutely awful idea. You can't get two cars down there when there is no snow. Someone is going to get killed. You come around that corner, it's a blind corner when you're coming off South Street. If you're coming up South Street and turning onto Russell Terrace with the block there, you can't see. So it's, it's dangerous. And again, uh, anything that the business could offer, it would be much better used as a residential. I mean, we, you don't, we don't wanna see a store put in in the middle of a residence. It's a very, it was a very quiet neighborhood when I first got there. It's more now busy, which happens, but um, I totally agree, disagree with having it changed to um, business. Thank you. Thank you. Want to come up and speak? My name is Terry Matrowski. I live at Wedgwood Terrace. And um, I feel that if there's any changes to be made, they need to do a traffic study beforehand. My main concern is having emergency vehicles being able to navigate the streets. Um, I see what happens by Crozier Field. Um, and 
the, the parking is all the way down Macintosh Terrace, and then if they have to enter through Russell Terrace, I don't know how a fire truck or an ambulance can get by there um, without causing an accident. Also, um, there are um, remnants of the old building that are underneath the lot, um, and I really don't know if there's records in the city hall to state what type of boilers or oil tanks or asbestos that could be down there, and if there's a mitigation plan that the developers have um, thought about. So I think those two things are very important to consider, the traffic and people's safety, and also the hazardous issue that could be seen by everybody in the neighborhood. Thank you. Is there anyone else then that would like to speak in favor or against the um, zone change this evening? I'll say a few things. I'm Heidi Ramoth, 72 Carlton Street. I know you guys know my opinion on this. I've spoken about it many times. I walked around the neighborhood for six, eight hours to get signatures from fellow opposers. Um, one of the things that they had been proposing to sort of better our neighborhood when they were making up their plans was to put like a bush berm and then put a fence on Carlton Street. It's all fine and good that there are things that they were trying to present to make it so we wouldn't see it. But in essence, that would effectively, literally cut off that lot from the entire neighborhood back. So instead of having a lot or houses with yards, we would then have a fence that we'd be staring at. And I do believe also that that fence would create a barrier that would make it a safe place for people who may want to go do drugs because they can hide right behind it and nobody's going to see them by the dumpster sitting up against the fence with a bunch of bushes. So that's just one more thing that I have to say. I don't want to be looking at this building outside my kitchen window every day. I don't want to see the birds and the animals go away. My neighbors garden every single day. They're elderly and they love their yard. There's going to be oil. There's going to be excess trash. There's going to be a lot of noise and people present all day. It's also been presented that, okay, it's a business. It'll only be open during business hours. I think those business hours were presented as like 8 to 9 p.m., but that's not going to stop people from using that lot in off hours. So I'm requesting that you please oppose this zone change. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak this evening? Sure. Um, so given that no one else from the public would like to make any comments in favor or against um, this project, I'll uh, turn the mic over to uh, Councilor Jordan. I had one question, and that is if, if the abutters um, are going to put in a opposition petition, just know there is a process and that that has to be done before we take a final vote of the Hoyo City Council on it. And if the sufficient, under the state law, if a sufficient number of the abutters do uh, come out in opposition, then that does raise the bar to a three quarters vote of the city council from a two thirds. So just be aware of that. And there are uh, time limits and things to do that. So just be aware of that. Uh, a couple of points. Um, one is that um, I, I too am, uh, am I am also in opposition to the zone change for a variety of reasons. Um, one, first of all, is this is not the highest and best use for the property. Uh, number one is it really is to would be best for the neighborhood as it's currently zoned, which would be for two family houses. Um, even if the petitioner could come forward with maybe something like RM20 or RM60 or some type of zoning that would allow maybe four families or multifamily uh, to go on that parcel, uh, maybe um, with multiple units with maybe a little parking lot in the back, that type of a situation. But nevertheless, it would be residential only uh, zoning. I think that is clearly what's best. Because to go to a business zone and to put this in as currently proposed, 
is just going to be too much on the neighborhood there. For example, um, when you look at the applicant's proposal, they have the inlet and outlet coming in on South Street. That's fine enough. But then they have an exit both ways coming up and down Carlton Street to come off the property. So you can just imagine you're going to get all of that additional traffic that goes through. These auto parts stores are not very desirable businesses to have next to you, especially if you have a house. So for certainly the two immediate butters as well as the peep, the two homes uh, that are immediately across the street and then on the other one across from Carlton, you're uh, actually, there's probably two, really, because there's one diagonally next door to um, the one at the corner of Wedgwood and Carlton. I mean, those are just going to be really noxious to you. There's just no two ways around that, right? First of all, these stores o stay open till 9 o'clock. You're going to have all kinds of lighting there at all hours of, uh, you know, in one breath, you want lighting because you want to keep people out, and then in the other breath, you don't want lighting because it's going to be shining on your property. Uh, the, f the reality is, is I've seen these, everybody, you just know your common sense experience dealing with these auto parts store. We have one a little further down on South Street. People come in, they're working on their cars, they're playing their radios, they're, you know, it's like, hey, it's Saturday afternoon, I want to have a good old time working on my car and I'm going to do it in, front, in the auto parts store. And so for anybody that lives around that, that's a lousy, lousy deal. There's no question that's going to lower the value of your home. So the point of doing zone change is how do we all live in harmony with each other while at the same time trying to help owners make the best use of their property? Well, the reality is, is this used to be a school. And it, the school predates zoning. <clears throat> but when zoning came through, it was zoned R2 because the, the city uh, leaders um, made a determination that this was best for residential. And I don't think there's a good cause here, and we'll hear at some point petitioners are going to show up again, and I'll say the same thing, is that what it really is best here would be to have residential. That would be consistent. That wouldn't really affect your property values. In fact, if anything, new construction next to you would probably help your property values. Um, so that is the answer. But what they want to do is make money. Come in develop it, purchase the property, sell it to somebody, to, to the national chain, and then they move on. And they go off to Natick or wherever, and you'll never see these people. These petitioners are not going to be the ultimate owners of the property, you understand. These are development companies. They come in, whim, bang, boom, promise you the world, never going to be a problem. And then they drive off to Connecticut or Boston or New York City, and you'll never see those, but every Saturday afternoon, you know, you're going to hear whatever the, whatever the radio choice of car fixers is going to be, you're going to be right across the street from that. And so what does that do to your property? That's not fair to you. So, um, and then trash. I mean, we all know, right? We've been in these parking lots. We know what they happen. There's the oil bottles, and there's the wrappers, and all of the trash that goes with it. And no matter how much these stores will promise you, we will religiously and faithfully clean it up. That just doesn't happen, right? Can we all agree that that doesn't always happen? So, and then there's going to be the dumpsters, and then the dumpsters have to get emptied, and, you know, blah, 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 and there's all of that that goes with it. This is a noxious thing, right? So this is not what we're trying to do with some of these petitions or not, I shouldn't say we, but people who come forward, they have these parcels and they want to do something and then they're going to come in and they say, counselors, you're not pro-business unless you give us these things. And so what we have to do is remind them that you people, our good residents, are investors too, right? You've made a big, it's probably the biggest investment of your whole life you've made by purchasing your home. And so we have to honor and respect your investment as well. And so what they're trying to do is fit these type of projects inside really what these uses are really not designed for in residential neighborhoods. This belongs up at Kmart Plaza, or this belongs up by the mall, or this belongs down on Main Street where we used to have Automania, or you know those type of places. That's where these things belong, right? Not next door to your house. And that's just the reality of it. So there's a reason it's zoned residential. I'm of the opinion 
you're of the opinion they should stay residential. So that's certainly how I'm going to vote, and we'll see how it all plays out when our petitioners show up at some point, and I'll give them the same speech. And if you come again, you'll get to hear it all over again. So thanks for coming down from my perspective. But if there is going to be, I did want to say that a Butters uh, petition, just follow the formalities of that and make sure we get it. Thank you. Did you want to say anything before I? No. Um, so if I may, I'd like to uh, entertain a motion to suspend, suspend the necessary rules and find out um, mm -hmm. from our legal counsel um, what that process is. Um, the, so moved. I need a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Um, so, Paul, the residents submitted a 100-plus um, name petition to us this evening. Um, can we submit this to the clerk on their behalf since they submitted it here, or should we return it to them to su submit to the clerk and validate the names directly? It was the Atlas, Atlas Copco property with... Um, so mm -hmm. Okay, so I think then I'm going to return this to the petitioners. Um, I will um, make a note for the record that, that this um, petition has 164 names on it, um, and they need to be validated by the clerk. One thing. Will it be noted in the minutes then? Yes. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, Brian Ramoth again. Um, we'll follow the appropriate uh, official piece. Um, just for your awareness, the five or six houses you mentioned, they're on here. I would imagine. <laughs> but, but that's a separate petition. Uh, no, I got you. No, nope. we'll, we'll follow the official follow piece. Follow the formalities. And we appreciate the, uh, the heads up on, the, uh, on that. We'll, uh, we'll go through the formal piece, and yeah. we'll, we'll get together again. Thank you. Beth? Uh, John Gunn, uh, just a question on formality. Uh, do you have an anticipated date where the final decision would be made? How much time do we have to go through this process? Um, so we need to um, continue this public hearing to a date certain. Um, I know that our next uh, ordinance committee meeting has um, a number of other fairly um, controversial um, public hearings before it. So I think we need to move to a month out on, on this um, hearing. What do the rest of you think? I think we can move to the 25th. You think it can be moved yeah. to the 25th? Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, continue to the 25th. Second. Okay, so in a, in a, we have a month, and uh, will that be in front of the... That would be two weeks. Two weeks. Oh, two weeks. And uh, that'll be in front of the complete council? No. Nope. meeting in... Uh, no, that'll be here on oh. the 25th. We'll, I would assume petitioner will tell us whatever they wish to tell us. We'll take a vote up to full council for the first meeting in May, which is the first Tuesday of May, and that's when the final vote will occur. Okay. And the, the planning Thank board you. took a fine, closed the public hearing this evening and took a final vote, Correct. So they'll, they'll be, that recommendation will be over to us um, for our next meeting, and so we can make a decision um, and close the hearing at the next meeting. Thanks again. Anybody else like, like to speak on this item then? So the motion has been made and seconded to continue the public hearing to the 25th. Of April, yeah. Um, of April at 6.30 p.m. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Three to zero. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, um, item number four, I'm sorry, item number three. I'm writing backwards. Motion to take that off the table. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to move to item three. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. This is an order filed by Councilor Jourdain um, that the Ordinance Committee review section 18-35, Regulation of Blighted and Vacant Buildings, to consider revising the appeal process for vacant building registration and applicable fees. We do have um, the Board of Health Director as well as um, Dr. Malzell from the um, uh, Board of Health. Yeah. I was thinking this kind of four is along the same lines. Maybe if we could take up four off the table with it as well. Sure. So is there a motion to suspend the necessary rules then? Yep. Take item number four up as well. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Um, so we're taking up items three and four as a package. I'll read four into the record and then I'll note. Um, I could actually invite the planning. I'm sorry. <laughs> the Board of Health. Um, director as well as the commissioners if you want to come in to join us for the conversation. 
Um, so item number four is that the city council consider Pitsy. amending section 18-35 with respect to the vacant building fee charge in that we consider suspending the fee if owner has an open and valid building permit on said vacant property and work is actively taking place. Also, if a new owner purchases a vacant property, the vacant permit fee um, charge starts at least one year for the new owner. Okay, um, I will note that earlier um, Brian submitted a letter on behalf of the um, Holyoke Board of Health. Um, the letter is written by Patty Mertes, who is the chair, and it says that the Board of Health Commissioners request that the um, process of appeal for the vacant and blighted um, building ordinance be reconsidered. We have been hearing appeals for the past several months, and many of these issues that come up during this process have to do with building codes and regulations. Our expertise is in the area of public health, and we feel that a commission of people with building code and regulation expertise would be better um, at administrating this hearing process. Um, so we'll note that for the record. Um, we also have Dr. Malzell and Brian Fitzgerald here um, this evening. Um, so Kevin and uh, Dan, you filed these orders. Yeah. Do you want to speak to them briefly before we invite um, the department head to yeah. speak? If I, if I could, if I may, uh, just to tee up the conversation. So we have uh, a blighted ordinance uh, such that um, we are of the opinion that vacant buildings are not a good thing for the city of Holyoke. And that after a certain level, we understand that the, the courses of life such as they are um, cause from time to time buildings to be vacant, i.e. a relative passes on and you know the family needs to sell the house and these things occur and you know a house is gonna be vacant from time to time, perhaps even an apartment block. Well, what we find is troublesome as a community is that when these things go on for an extended period of time, we're talking a matter of years, then we know what happens when buildings are vacant and abandoned, uh, and this goes on for a period of years. Uh, they either become attractive nuisances, uh, they fall into disrepair, uh, insurance companies are not very fond of insuring abandoned buildings, and so insurance begins to fade, uh, and we know all of the, the number of noxious things that occurs from there. So. We have an ordinance that says, um, articulates a schedule by which various buildings will pay registration fees if they are um, uh, empty. And if we wanted to recently uh, increase these fees because we wanted to create disincentives for people to, on a long-term basis, to keep these buildings vacant and in their possession. So thus that, if they were going to keep them for a period of years um, empty, they're going to pay a pretty substantial registration uh, fee for that. Um, the view is, if you can't make up your mind after a year or two that you either want this building and fix it up and go do something with it, uh, then you know, you've got to make a decision, either sell it, fix it up, occupy it, do something with this building. Okay. So, you know, I'll uh, look at Essex House, right? Empty for 10 years plus, and there's, there's a litany of others. So we, we recognize these end up uh, sometimes end up becoming the public charge, and we end up paying for these things. So there's a big cost, public societal cost for these things. So the point is we want to enforce to the human extent as possible these registration fees. We want to make sure that we are charging each and every owner who should have these and fall under these circumstances. Absent some particularly overwhelming reason for appeal that they would not have to pay this, um, they better come up with a pretty good story. Maybe, uh, you know, six months or 12 months is one thing. But for period, you know, you're going to have a tough sell to say, I'm, it's been empty for five years and I can't make up my mind if I'm selling it or occupying it. Well, then pay the bill and don't come crying to us about it. So we, I wanted to make sure to revisit this appeal process. One, is it the view of the Board of Health now? I know uh, Commissioner Mertes raises a question. Maybe she's, they're not the right venue, that it should be somewhere else. Maybe we talk about that tonight, but somebody, whoever is, we want to make sure we're collecting these registration fees, number one. 
that we're religiously putting those out there, inventorying these buildings, sending the bills. The bills were designed to also help raise funds for your department and others who have to administer all of this. And um, at that point to uh, create, and let's have a reasonable appeal process if there's really extenuating circumstances. But other than that, I'd like the board to say, thank you, but pay your bill. So that's my angle at all of this. Um, I do know that, I know Paul has been doing a lot of work, I believe, with the Board of Health on all of this. And I did speak to Sarah and, and Paul indirectly, and it was mentioned that it really was a time to take a step back, have a review of this. How is it going so far? What can we do to improve it? So basically, any part of that is all on the table, but philosophically, that's the reason this ordinance is in place and why we want to have pretty stringent enforcement to, to, that we can, because it's a real problem in the city. So that's my angle on it. Um, Dan, before we invite our guests to speak, do you want to chime in at all? Just, just briefly, uh, the, the reason I had filed my order was that there's opportunities to, to uh, provide uh, an, an atmosphere that allows folks that have, may have had a fire um, and insurance issues take place, or they're, they, they're interested in, in purchasing properties within the city of Hoyoke, uh, and due to the, if, I, if, if A owns a building and sells it to B, the fact that it was vacant for these long years of time, it gets turned on to the, the new owner. So if, I, if, I, if, if Joe sells me a building, I buy it, it's been vacant for five years, so you're paying $6,000 a, a year, um, there's no, break for the new owner and, and obviously we don't want we don't want you know going from one LLC to another LLC we want a legitimate buy and sale somebody says they come to City Hook, they love it they want to go ice skating that's a community field they see a 10 unit building they want to buy it it's been vacant for 10 years the, 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 the former owner is currently paying the vacant building fee I mean should that be turned on to the new owner the other question becomes Let's say there's a, you know, a valid electrical permit pulled out, a valid building permit pulled out, uh, proof that there's a, you know, someone that cares. The intent of this, this ordinance, in my opinion, was that you, know, you had the guy that owned the building and he lived in, uh, he, he owned the Essex house and he lived in uh, you know, uh, Natick and was just, in, just, you know, just ignored himself ignored the building. I mean, I, I don't think that's intent. I think we have a lot of local business owners and property owners that could you know, not, you know, could, could renovate these properties and get them back on the tax rolls. I mean, in, in the other point is that the, the seven points that talk about what exactly is a blighted building. I mean, it seems like if I kept the grass cut, if I kept it boarded and secured, if I inspected it daily, if I had the fire department ensuring that it wasn't a fire hazard, let's just say I put fire alarms in a vacant building. Okay, I kept the grass clean, I kept the trash out of the area, I did all these things to make it boarded, secured, and safe. I don't know that it would fall underneath this ordinance. And you know, ordinances are, are great and sometimes they need a little tweaking. I just think that you know, we might wanna look at this a little bit and say, hey, you know, if a, if, if a corporation or a business owner or a landlord owns a property, they can ensure that it's maintained, it's safe and secure, and it's not a fire hazard and it's clean and all that sort of thing. I mean, should we be charging them up to $6,000 a year? Because if there's a fire in a 30 unit building, like we just had down, on, uh, down in the flats, I mean, what if it takes them 18 months to get the insurance money to figure out the cause of the fire? All that sort of investigation needs to take place. It's just something that needs to be considered. Do I think the Board of Health is the right venue for that? Personally, I do because the Board of Health is a very powerful agency. That Chapter 111 makes it a very powerful agency where, where they can cite many reasons, sources of filth. You know, the receivership program is, is, is basically run through health departments. Um, and I'm not, you know, this is not a quick fix. I'm just saying that if Dan Bresnan wanted to buy a vacant building, the day that I buy it should start year one of the vacant building fee, not year three, four, or five, however long it's, it's been built. So again, this is not a criticism on anyone. This is not just, it's just, you know, food for thought. We, we might, could we, could we do things a little differently? It might be better, maybe friendly or, absolutely. So that's just my thought. Thank you.
Brian, um, our uh, Board of Health Director, do you want to speak to this issue and how you're experiencing it in your office? Yeah, the, <clears throat> the ordinance itself has to be tweaked. You just want to use the microphone to make oh, sure the green I'm light sorry. is on. It's on, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yes, yes yeah. So the people at home can hear that. It's on. Just speak into it a uh, little bit more. The ordinance has to be tweaked in a lot of different areas, and, and, and I don't think my board members are the people to be doing the appeals first off. They have no experience in building. Uh, we've got other, I've been talking to Paul and some other departments. I think there's some of us that could do it besides our board, and I think it can be created and put into the ordinance. Um, <clears throat> Who do you recommend? Myself, Damien, and Paul. Building, Board of Health, and the Law Department. And, and this is all up for discussion. <clears throat> um, we've had a policy that was created by Paul and Damien. It's a policy, it's not in the ordinance, uh, to defer the fee if you've got a, an approved rehab plan that the building commissioner approved. That's a policy, it's not in the ordinance. I want that in the ordinance. Um, I want to be specific because there's a lot of we we, we uh, this is the farthest we've ever gone with this ordinance. When did you propose this, and when did it go into effect? 2009. Uh, this is the we we sent out liens this year. Uh, we're getting bombarded with people that are angry oh, well. from all over the city. Um, Should have been angry I, seven years ago. <clears throat> so we've got a, we've we've come a long way with this thing. You know about the houses that we get, we're getting back on the market. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, and it's not just through a receivership. It, Paul, Paul's in court. He could explain that a lot more than I could, uh, which I wish he would. So you guys know. No, we know. It's not just receivership. We'll stipulate to okay. receivership and um, getting those buildings back on. They're, they're wonderful. So I, I had one of my clerks create a list. We have the people that paid this year. There was, I'm just going to give you a couple numbers. 66 paid, 178 did not pay. Um, so that means we have over 200 abandoned properties? That, we are. Uh, so that's, two, that's over 240. I don't think that they're abandoned. Well, so they meet the... the, the they're, uh, they're, they're paying a registration fee. They, they're vacant. Uh, vacant buildings. They're, they're vacant buildings that they're okay. paying the registration fee. Greater than 240. Um, mostly, most of the uh, residential houses paid. Uh, a lot had paid last year, and for they didn't pay this year. I don't know if they were sold. We we just we we haven't gotten that far. Great. Um, what else did I want to touch on here? What do you think? Uh, so. How about the appeal process or the standard itself, Brian? So you say we should create a board that the three of you guys meet uh, and that what do you think should be the standard? Like what would be a good set of like this is the, you know, you know, the old proverbial, the dog ate my homework. Like what is the excuse that you should get out of not paying this in a particular year? What's your opinion on that? Like what's good enough, you know? I come in, I file, it's, let me give you an example of what I just don't want us to get played. We have an empty lot, and I won't use any names, but we have an empty lot across the street from a nice church, and it used to be, and it's also across from Mel's Restaurant. And we were told for years and years and years, it's common, it's common, it's common, it's common, it's still a dirt lot, right? I just want to make sure we don't have, I come in and every year I give you the sad song. You know, Brian, give me one more a year. I file one building permit and I never follow through. You know, at what point, you know. And these are things that Doc Mazzell can't answer. Or, well, of yeah, course, talk about we it, want Dr. Mazzell's opinion. There's we another microphone. Dr. Mazzell, there, there is another microphone for you if you want. Okay. Um, well, first of all, yes, we have, we've been inundated lately with appeals and, and, and 
we want to know are you what is your plan are you refurbishing it uh, and what is the time limit and then they come back another year and they start again well with this but things are tough and blah 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 so that um and and i don't think i think as uh, patty murdy said that that's not our expertise and it's wasting our time on stuff that we are not supposed to be doing we should be dealing with public health not with and and the and the and the ordinance says the appeal shall be limited solely to the issues of whether the building is vacant and how long this building has been vacant. What's that got to do with health? That the expertise should be the building commissioner, a committee that knows what they're doing on that. That's not our field. And it takes away time. Now, for some reason, I've been on this board for over 20 years. For some reason, in the last couple of years, we've been inundated. And we're spending three hours in a meeting. We can't get to the, the health issues. And we do, but it just goes on and on. And it's the same old thing. They bring the lawyers in, they start yakking, blah, 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 blah. and we don't want to be horrible about it. But you're right. Somebody has to be tougher than we are. Okay, maybe we're not tough. But that's not our field. And I do believe you have a point. If you don't, and they, they can sound you know, like they want to do things well. And, and some do oh, yeah. actually show something that they're doing. But I, I think it would be better serve the city if we had a uh, committee of people who are expertise in this and won't put up, won't sit there like stummies and uh, listen to what they say and say, okay, we'll give, come back in six months. Maybe that's be, be better. We're not certainly c competent enough to do that, I feel. Um, so Councilor Bresleyhan would like to speak, but I do think um, we should probably invite um, the legal department in for this conversation as well, because I feel like you may be inundated with additional appeals because of some changes that have happened in the department related to the board ups and the, the liens and whatnot that we've been doing. Councilor Bresleyhan. Thank you. Um, I, I, I would also re you know, suggest or make an offering that we, I mean, we have folks that own, we have Old Hoyoke Development, we have Virgilio Corporation, we have Blue House Incorporated. Um, we have some, some very large uh, property owners within the city of Hoyoke that could certainly speak to this. I, I will say that when, 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 the, when this concept came up for the vacant building ordinances, was, which was, we weren't setting precedent here, it was out there. I mean, the Board of Health, as Brian, as you know, is given this vast authority where a vacant building incurs sources of filth, right? Which are, could be rabies, could be people using drugs, could be any, any, of, those, any of those avenues of which are health disparities that we face. So it might not be like, is it gonna fix a teenage pregnancy rate in the city of Hoyle? No, but certainly a correlation could be made between vacant buildings and why the health Department or the Board of Commissioners would be looking at that situation. It, 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 I mean, it's clear to me. I, I mean, and, and I certainly, I, I don't, I, I have no problem. I think it's a great idea that have the law department, the health department. You guys are the day-to-day -day operations. The Board of Commissioners are the long-term, like, how are we going to get Hoyoke healthy? I agree with that. I agree with that. But obviously, when it was written, the concept was, like, you could kind of make the connection if we had a vacant home next to an occupied home and you know, raccoons are procreating and they have rabies and, you know, th th that's all, that's all be falls under the venue of sources of filth that the Board of Health by statute are supposed to enforce. So, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think it's a great idea because that's, and I would suggest on that board, you get the fire department involved, get someone from fire prevention, someone from health, someone from law, someone from building department. I think it's a great idea. I think that's where the appeal should go because they should be, the commissioners should be addressing the long-term health disparities that the city of Hoyoke is facing. And I would, again, recommend that if we have some landlords that wish to speak to that, I certainly would encourage the, 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 the committee to, do, to consider. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to speak to um, some changes in what the legal department is doing that may be related to this uh, inundation or other um, information you have about how you're experiencing this process? Uh, sure. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the rise in uh, appeals and uh, correspondence to the Board of Health correlates to some of the policy changes that have been made. Um, I, I think that uh, Council President is absolutely correct that uh, the Board of Health is the, uh, the correct agency to be uh, enforcing this. Uh, you know, vacant properties are inherently um, uh, 
a, a public health concern and regulated by uh, Chapter uh, 111. Uh, the challenge with the appeal process as it currently stands is that, as Dr. Mazel has indicated, the hearings become uh, a conflated conversation about not so much the appeal standard, as Dr. Mazel pointed out, which is the uh, duration of vacancy and the actual determination of vacancy, uh, which under the ordinance is simply defined as uh, where no lawful uh, residential use or uh, lawfully licensed business use is being performed. Uh, I mean, those really are respectively uh, in the jurisdiction of a, a health inspector to determine whether or not a property is up to the sanitary code and, and therefore a lawful habitation, uh, or uh, in the province of the, the building department uh, if, uh, if a property does not have a valid certificate of occupancy for, for, for the, uh, the use. So those appeal determinations are fundamentally within the, uh, the knowledge of uh, the Board of Health director, uh, the building commissioner, their, and, and their employees. Uh, but what happens at the appeal hearings is a conversation more along the lines of, of what we're talking about today, which is when should this fee be exempted or relaxed if somebody you know, certainly nobody's saying that Hoyo Catholic, uh, when they were rehabbing uh, the Hoyo Catholic building, somebody was saying that the vacant building, you know, they should be paying $3,000 a year, and they didn't because, uh, as, as was alluded to, there is a policy that says if you have an accepted rehab plan, uh, then this fee is going to be deferred based upon compliance with that, and that does need to be codified into ordinance because, frankly, there needs to be some certainty to that. Um, it, it's drawn from the purpose of this ordinance, which is to encourage the reconstruction, reuse, uh, rehabilitation of property. So I think it's a fair interpretation that uh, the Board of Health, uh, through the law department, has uh, suggested uh, to allow for this process. But all of that together uh, has led to an appeal process where after uh, the Board of Health staff has uh, sent out these letters, we've sent out demand notices, we've recorded a lien, we've added it to a tax bill. Then they go to the Board of Health Appeal and Dr. Mazel fairly says, what's going on? <laughs> what does this have to do with uh, public health? So uh, I, don't, uh, I don't wanna offer an answer to any of these questions yet. I think what uh, will really be beneficial is uh, uh, understanding what the implementation process has been, what the results have been, uh, what the feedback I've received from the many property owners who call the law department um, has been, and to answer some of those questions in, in the ordinance. And uh, hopefully I can help uh, with that process. Councilor McGivern. Thank you. Well, the, from what little I understand, I, I think you're I agree with that the Board of Health is the correct uh, agency to handle the uh, the vacant building uh, situation. But isn't it true that the appeal process doesn't have to be the Board of Health Commission? There could be an officer appointed. There can be many different ways to handle the appeal process that would not burden the, uh, the commission's meetings themselves. I mean, you yourself could be appointed the appeal officer. Brian could be. Could be someone that, you know, make the practical sense out of it but it does not have to be the commission himself. No, I agree. In the same way that we have um, parking tickets no. adjudicated by the legal department. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I have Councilor Jordan, and then I'll come over to oh. Councilor Sullivan. Oh, you're all set, Councilor McGivern? I'm fine, I'm not sure. Good. So, Mm -mm. I think um, Paul wants to respond. To oh, go ahead, Paul. Well, my response is I, I'm not certain. I believe that uh, the Board of Health is uh, uh, under the under the ordinance. Uh, no, but what Joe's point is, it doesn't have to be that. It is currently under the ordinance. Oh, correct. Absolutely. So it could be changed. Absolutely. Yeah, that's what we're contemplating. Um, so the point I wanted to make also is that um, this in other communities, perhaps an ordinance of this nature is not even necessary, right? But this is a serious public health epidemic as well as massive economic development epidemic in our community. It's, I, I think it's one of those key linchpins of which way this community is gonna go, right? We're either going to, I mean, just by those that we've known on this list, 240 vacant properties 
That's an inordinate number, and that's probably not everybody, right? Let's just assume that we didn't capture the entire universe. I mean, you go to other cities our size, is that the type of number that they would have? I would be hard-pressed to believe that that's the case. That is a lot of buildings. And so that's a lot of opportunity for things to go really bad. These things, as I stated earlier, become attractive nuisances. Um, they look horrible. Um, people are squatters in them. I mean, just a whole, it's just terrible for the city. We have this ordinance on the books to root out vacant buildings in the city. That's the whole point of this ordinance. That's why it was adopted seven or eight years ago. That's the whole point of it. Registration fees were created to create a disincentive to be a vacant building because we wanted to people to pay if you're leaving a vacant building. So what's the, you know, don't leave your building vacant. Do something with it. Occupy it or sell it. All these stories is all nonsense. One of the things that we had a very specific, as, as articulated, very clear-cut standard. And then I think what maybe is making it murky is these regulations that are being created. And of course, really regulations are not supposed to exceed their statutory authority. So to the extent that these regulations are saying other th things other than what the ordinance is rather clear-cut standard is, somewhat nebulous to me but we'll just put that on the shelf to say it's it's consistent but it's either vacant or it's not vacant right so if you have somebody come in and say the really the ground for appeal is i have not been vacant my building is not vacant and you have said it is vacant and that is my grounds for appeal yeah, point number yeah. two You've said that my building has been vacant for three years, and you, the fine is X, as opposed to six months. And so you've assessed me at an overly uh, aggressive fine. It's not, oh, well, I have a building plan, and, you know, someday down the road, um, you know, I want to help Holyoke and fix this building, and what a nice, wonderful person I am. And, you know, that's not the standard. Somehow that leaked into this so we need to be careful that we follow the standard and people really have a very it's it's cut and dry unless you want us to expand it maybe you feel we should make this regulation the ordinance we'll speak to that but this is either vacant not vacant how long i i agree with you because that's what exactly happens they come in and you know they bring the lawyers with them and we are certainly don't want to discourage businessmen from making the think it's profitable sure. and do something. We don't want to be, you know, oh, you can't do that and make them in trouble. But it, it seems to be it just next six months or a year they come back. Well, we are working on it. Yes. And, the, and so, right. you know, who's going to, I think if we. You're creating headaches for yourself, really. Oh, absolutely. Because uh, now you're weighing the merits of, is this progress? Is yeah, this not, not progress? progress. And, exactly. then you're, and then you rightly say, well, what the heck? I'm a doctor. That's How do right. I know if. One more window in the building is progress or not progress, right? I mean, Absolutely. I agree with you. I, I couldn't agree so. more. So I want to, if we could just, as we're doing all of this, get back to the fact that that was the intent of the ordinance. It was to be heavy-handed, quite frankly. Okay, really. In fact, if there was any doubt as to the intent, about a year ago, we doubled all the fines. So now I'm sure that's going to jump up people's attention, right? Because we're saying one more thing we want to do to step on the gas on this. Because I, me, Kevin, and I'm sure a general prevailing view I believe in this room is, we want to stamp out vacant buildings to the most human extent possible. That if you either have the capital to put into the building and make it nice and be successful and we do whatever we can to help you be successful. But if you don't, you're going to have to sell the building. Otherwise, you're going to be writing us a check for six grand a year. And that's, and that's something most people don't want to do. So sell the building and don't pay it. They're not doing it. Right. So then we're going to lean it, and then we should take executions on our liens and do all the other things if people don't pay their taxes. And then we'll sell it to some, and we'll have an auction. 
just like we would do if you didn't pay taxes. It should go to tax title, or if you didn't pay your water and sewer bill and all this. We have got to be Johnny on the spot on these things early in the process, because what happens is if we let them go long periods of time, these buildings aren't worth anything. If anything, we wouldn't dare want to take them back to Excel. Let us remember Essex House, right? Somebody made the decision. I'm gonna, gonna leave names out to protect the innocent here to the extent they are innocent. But some policy mayor, a, 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 an elected official in this city made a decision to take Essex House as a tax title property because they thought that was a good idea. And that's how we got to own the Essex House. And we're paying lawsuit settlements ever since. So, you know, my point is for every Essex House, there's more Essex Houses. And in that 240, some of them are probably like, there's a single family house on Hillside Avenue. It's actually a really nice, little ranch house. You wouldn't, if you drove by it, you'd never know it's vacant. But that house has been empty for about three years. Now, luckily nobody's broken into it yet because neighbors kind of watch out for it. But the owner doesn't do anything with the property and it just sits there and they never sell it and it's just vacant. So guess what? They can go pony up a thousand bucks or whatever the bill is every year and send it to us because we got to send a cop by every so often to keep an eye on things. I mean, it's, we got to create incentives because we want a family buying that house, you know. We I, are making progress with the residential. Okay. You sure are. Huge progress. Big progress. You guys are doing a great job. Interestingly, right. interestingly enough, in my neighborhood in Wyckoff Park, there's been an abandoned house. I'm not going to say who or what. My wife has said something about it and got... You know, he got upset, but he's not, it's, it's, it's right across from our house, actually. And it sits there, and, and it's perfectly, could be a wonderful place for somebody to live and buy a house, and nothing happens. And it's really, it's really an abandoned property in Wyckoff Park yeah. for 10 years. And it goes on. It's never come up to a hearing. I've never heard anything. And I'd have to recuse myself because I'm like, right. So there we go. Uh, um, Councillor Sullivan, you're in queue. Do so you want to speak to this issue? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've heard um, from Brian now, and I understand the uh, enforcement part of it, staying with the Board of Health. But when I listen to this, the description of what we need for a real appeals process, what I'm hearing is a description of what I've been listening to for a while here now of an informal blighted properties committee that's already been formed. And in the back of my mind, I've been questioning, uh, how, how does the city government form an informal committee that's making all these decisions and meeting like this without being formally recognized? But, uh, so maybe that's something, uh, this would be a way of more formalizing that group. I think they're doing a great job. Um, and maybe that's what should be put in place. It seems to me that the job they've done already is what we're describing here. We've got all the right people on it. We've got the fire chief on it. I believe you're on that one, Brian. Um, we've got Damien's on that. Um, we've got good people on it, and they're doing good work. Are you talking about the problem property group problem or a different Problem properties group, group. right. I, I called it blighted pro problem properties. It's blighted problems. But, um, and maybe, maybe that should be formalized and let them handle the appeals process and, and then let Board of Health enforce it. That's my first on everything I've heard here is it's already in place. Let's hand it to them. They, they know what's going on with these properties. They also know what the good exceptions would be because you've got the right people there. Um, okay, this, this developer is doing this, they're doing this. We've seen this much progress. Let's continue it. And then it, it, it doesn't have to be for a specific amount of time. Um, uh, I'd like, uh, if we've got an opportunity here tonight, um, uh, you know, we, we, this regulation we've got, I, I think it's great. It, it's it's well intentioned. I agree with everything Councilor Jordan Dane has said about it. But we're catching up some. We're catching up in this thing some of the very investors we desperately need to attract to the city also, and are getting tangled up in it. So if they had some knowledgeable people outside of just the health aspect of it, of okay, what's been addressed through the fire department? What's been addressed through um, building permits? What's going on and monitoring this, 
this on a on a monthly basis uh, is what's really going on. Um, you know, we need we need to not penalize or make it more financially difficult for people to come into the city and help turn things around. All right. If we have a chance tonight, we've got a couple of people in the audience. If we could let them just uh, share with the committee their uh, experience and frustrations about some of the hurdles they've run into because of this and the, the financial strains and how having this uh, appeals process in place would really help them. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to say a few things before um, we allow or invite the, um, the public to speak. So um, I agree. I think that um, I think that I filed this order actually in 2009. Um, and it was for sure to um, start to create incentives for um, building owners to uh, turn their properties around and to um, have the city take an interest in um, figuring out a way that it can incentivize um, redevelopment downtown. Um, I do, um, from what I'm hearing tonight, I do understand that we have to strike a balance between um, creating incentives that are um, not just sticks but carrots as well. How do we how do we make it attractive um, for investment as opposed to um, simply punishing people who aren't investing? I think that we have to strike a balance there, um, and I do think that. Uh, perhaps we need to revisit the criteria for, you know, having a, a, a vacant building. And maybe it's not a vacant building so much as a blighted building that we want to um, put those sticks um, alongside as opposed to the carrots. Because I think that it takes some time to bring a building back before you could, you could actually have people inhabit it. And I think that we want to recognize people that are making investments and that are making progress um, and, and making vacant buildings um, rehab, re, rehab, ha, rehabitable. Um, however, um, I, I do think that we, you know, as Kevin was pointing out earlier, we want to, you know, make sure people are um, serious about the investments that they're making and not just sitting on properties um, and waiting uh, for, you know, the right other investor to come along and, and develop the property. We, we want people doing the work um, that's required to bring the, bring, bring the buildings back in a timely manner. So I do, I do hear that there needs to be some sort of balance struck between um, the, where we're putting the sticks and how we're um, going to be punishing perhaps the, the blighted properties that aren't being um, taken care of um, and how we can further incentivize investments in properties um, and recognize the progress um, that people are making that, that have a uh, active building plan of some sort. So with that, um, do we want to make a motion to suspend the rules and allow some of these property sure. owners to speak? Yeah, I'll move. So move second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, so we'll open up um, the floor to um, any of the residents that are here tonight that want to speak, um, especially the, the building owners from their, their personal experiences with the um, vacant and blighted um, building fees. Thank you. My name is Ilya Schneider on Blue House Property Management and a few properties here in the Holyoke area. Um, I feel that I agree with the, the concept of this wholeheartedly. I mean, I own properties that next door to it have had buildings that have been vacant and blighted for 10 years, 20 years, whatever it is, and it's a nuisance to uh, our property where there's people do, uh, doing drugs behind it, there's animals, there's whatever else. But I think that we need to quantify exactly uh, what, it, uh, what the goal of this is. And I'll, I'll use a perfect example. I purchased a building that had sustained a major fire at the intersection of Dwight Street and Elm Street next to the post office. Um, I, I purchased the property. Um, we've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating the building. We've paid twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in real estate taxes since the acquisition of the property. And I receive a bill uh, or uh, a, a, an invoice that it's a, a blighted property. To me, that's not the goal of this, uh, uh, of this ordinance. Property owners, investors that are going out, that are pulling permits, that are doing work, that are doing all the things that the city wants, uh, I think something like this is a complete discouragement to what it is that the ordinance should be uh, promoting. Um, I also think that we need to quantify uh, when the property is, uh, is vacant uh, and talking to um, something Mr. Bresnahan uh, addressed earlier. 
uh, I bought a, a property on, uh, on Lyman Street. So there was an occupied eight unit property and with it was a property that had sustained a major fire. I honestly don't know, five years, 10 years, whatever it is. I purchased the property January 22nd, 2016. I get an invoice as if I've, uh, I've owned it indefinitely for whatever. That to me is a discouragement. At some point as, a prop, as an investor, why do I go out and buy a building that all of a sudden there's a $3,000 or $6,000 from the get-go whack? Uh, I understand that if I were to take uh, ownership of a property and transfer it from one LLC to another LLC or uh, Greg Virgilio and I pass buildings back and forth, obviously that's not an arm's length transaction. And maybe the law department obviously doesn't want to get involved with the regulating what is and what isn't an arm's length transaction. But in the reality, I don't think the city's ordinance is intended to preclude people from going out and buying buildings that are sitting there vacant, that have had major issues, because I as an owner or I as an investor am not going to go out and buy a building if from day one I get hit with a, uh, a fee of whatever else. I think the clock should start at, at that point. If it's an arm's length transaction and I bought a building, it should start. And the other thing is, is it January 1st, hypothetically, or September 1st, or whatever else? I mean, is it the first year we give a property owner grace period and then January 1 of the following year or July 1 being a calendar year or whatever the city council decides? At that point, those rules need to be implemented. I think that when the, the idea, the uh, the concept of this ordinance is great. Nobody wants these blighted buildings. Nobody wants all the problems that they cause. I think that we need a little more clarification as far as, you know what, somebody's going out spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate a building. Should that person be penalized? I strongly believe they should not. Somebody buys a building. Should we discourage people from buying blighted buildings? I firmly believe we should not, but I think that the, the city council needs to put clear procedures in place. I've, I've heard about the appeals process numerous times here, and that, that's not anything I came to, to speak to uh, uh, about, but I think that's obviously something that, that should be addressed. But to me, I think the actual ordinance needs to be beefed up a little bit with some clarification on what exactly are we trying to encourage here and what we're not. Thank Can I you. ask a clarifying question? This is very helpful, by the way. Thank you for coming tonight. I'm, I'm with you pretty much on point one, which is you're in the process of substantially and materially fixing the building. Therefore, is the building, in fact, vacant? I think that would speak to how we define the term vacant. I think we can fix that in a definition section, probably, of the ordinance. Point number two, though, I'm somewhat um, not of the same view, and here's why. You make the point that you purchase a building that, say, is vacant for 10 years, and in it, it's accrued, say, $10,000 in vacant building fees that have now been assessed. Explain or distinguish the difference between that and any owed or accrued property taxes that would be owed on it. Wouldn't you factor that into the price with the previous owner such that um, if they owed the city of Hoyoke $10,000 that that would be squared up during the sale process? Uh, for example, uh, this would be something, um, you know, the di uh, it seems at closing of this uh, real estate transaction, as you acquire the property, that would be taken care of uh, with all of the other municipal charges. If they had a sewer bill, a property tax bill, this should not be your burden. And if the new owner is acquiring the property, I'm sure you, if, you, if he asked you, the seller, to acquire this, then I'm sure you would factor that into the price. So my point further on that is um, we don't want to get into a situation where people say, oh, well, I've ridden it out for 10 years and I never pay the fine, you know, holy oak, uh, just add it to my lien. And then some nice gentleman like you is going to come in and tell us, hey, I put that 10 grand back into the building. I'm the nice guy. You know, forget the seller. He was a jerk, but I'm the good guy now. So in the meantime, we've rewarded jerk. And, uh, you know, to help you, 
but we don't want to create those type of incentives. So if, maybe you could address that. Of course. Uh, absolutely, Councillor Jane. Uh, my opinion is this. I'm not looking to uh, have those arrearages wiped away. I agree with you 100%, just like past due uh, property taxes or city liens or anything of that kind, that would need to be handled. What I'm talking about is starting the clock from day one as far as the new liens going forward. So oh, there's a graduated scale. I believe it's 500 and then 1,000 and 1,500. I buy a property, I'm already at $3,000 from day one when I close. I see. And I'm, I'm saying that this is now that I'm the owner, I should be granted, again, not, not shuffling between uh, oh, LLCs, okay. but as a new owner, I should be granted from day one. Okay. Thank you. All right. That's very, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Bartley. Yeah, I kind of address, I, I, that's, I just want to address that point because I, so I, it's at a certain stage here, I'll, I'll, I'll make a couple of motions relative to some of the things that uh, Paul said or, or uh, Mr. Schneider said. But uh, yeah, I thought it was pretty clear what, what you were saying is that from day one, once you become a new owner, that yeah, you shouldn't be, have to be impose a vacant building fee. There should be some sort of grace period. There, there should also be, you know, these policies that are, exist that they're policies and they're not codified. I think Paul made the point, well, listen, we're not perfect, right? But th these are things that have to be codified and, and I'll make a motion to do that. And we'll have the law department come back with a draft uh, soon when I get a second and a majority vote. And then, but I think the, the, the last point uh, relative to where, where, uh, where my friend might got confused, there are existing, there could be existing uh, uh, fines imposed by the Board of Health, um, but in my experience, and I've done a lot of real estate closings, I mean, I mean triple digits, so I would say a lot. Um, so I don't remember once ever seeing on a municipal lien certificate anything relative to a uh, fine imposed for abandoned buildings. And I think that the law department should certainly address that, and that should be part of the process and procedure that the that the uh, collector of taxes um, follows when she or he is is um, compiling the municipal lien certificate. So, as you know, on a municipal lien certificate, Ilya, you're you're an experienced developer. L those those um, charges, you know, your gas and electric, your sewer, they're apportioned as of what? As of the day, day of the day of the closing, right? So, any fines that have accrued, well. Up to days of closing. Well, who who's who who bears the burden for that? The seller. Well, seller. That's right. And I think that was a point you were trying. I think yeah. that. Was, oh, I, 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 I misunderstood the well, point. I, well, well, no. I thought I, you were getting hit with this well, big bill when you. Well, hold on, Mr. Paul, Mr. President. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not pointing a finger at anybody because just because I, I don't. It's no. confusing. It was, Although, I mean, I just do this stuff all the time, so it's not confusing. But it's confusing to anyone. What what the heck's a municipal lien certificate? I mean. Probably most of us in the room don't even know what it is, but th that's part of the process that the law department is going to going to help us to um, uh, clarify for for you, the developer. And so when it comes down to the closing time, that you, you know what costs are yours, and then when you move forward, that we should put in that grace period, that one year grace period, or whatever, eighteen months. A and further, it, we we should we should codify that there's a. Um, you know, if there's some kind of a if there's some kind of a plan. To move forward, and evidence of that would be, I don't know, a building permit, sure. and, and progression on the building permit. I mean, it's not that difficult to get a building permit, but you actually have to swing a hammer. So, or yeah, do th these are to, these are straightforward, straightforward things. And then ultimately, in my opinion, I think Joe's hit the hit the nail on the head with if if we don't have to have the the board of health, um, you know, three laypersons, Stanley, if we can just have in our ordinance have. Um, the uh, health commissioner, the building uh, inspector, or um, I don't know, the, the law department, some, somebody, we could, we could codify that to, to make sure that you three are the experts that can enforce uh, the necessary provisions, assuming we can do that under, under state law, Paul. So, thank you. Um, Dr. Mazel. Oh, just put your microphone on. Oh, uh, we did have a similar appeal like that, and we did not uh, uh, w what we did was said, no, you're starting from the beginning. It's not fair for you to take on 
So I think we've had a case like that, but we, you, you've never appealed to us, so we never got the... the... The reason I didn't was, truthfully, I read the ordinance, and I felt that there was no appeal based on the ordinance, so my appeal went to Councilor Bresnahan, where I said, Danny, this isn't fair. And he said, okay, let's discuss it, let's bring it up at City Council, because to me, bringing it to the Board of Health as far as appeal, I'm talking about what's fair and not fair, whereas I think the appeal really needs to come before the City Council for there. clarification of the ordinance, not to the Board of Health, which is going to say, I can justify whether it's vacant or not vacant. I don't have the authority to say, yes, I can, no, I can't. So that was why I have an appeal to you. I, I brought it before the City Council. Okay. okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Um, Councilor Sullivan. Just a, a quick note, one, one other reason to uh, address this now, if uh, the city's still facing this 10 years from now, you follow the same math, we're looking at um, a, a property uh, with liens against it, $6,000 a year for 10 years down the road from now. That's going to be $60,000 in blighted building fees and somewhere between ten dollars and $20,000 in unpaid real estate tax. So we're going to have a number that's you know, six-fold that, add the two together, plus any underpaid suitables, nobody's going to touch the property. And it's going to be sold or auctioned free of lien, you know, which I think we have a good process going now that we didn't have for years and years and years here where stuff is going up for auction and being addressed in a, in a lot more timely fashion. Yeah, I think the point there, Mike, is we can't let it get to that point where it's sitting for 10 years. You've got to, that's why I was encouraged, Brian, you said you set a set of liens relative to these, correct, recently? To, to David's... Yeah. No, but the point is, is once you put these liens, and if they don't go paid, we got to be aggressive in going to tax title exactly. on these yeah. things so that they don't get to its negative equity. Right, exactly. Right. Thank you. Name and um, address for the record. Of course, thanks. Uh, Michael Moriarty, I live at 1 Lexington Avenue in Holyoke, and I'm the executive director of 1 Holyoke CDC, which is based at 70 Lyman Street in Holyoke, uh, as I think most of you know. And um, so we have a particular situation with these um, ordinances uh, because, uh, you know, we, we are actively involved in rehabilitating abandoned properties. Um, and there are a lot of difficulties and nuances I think really need to be appreciated as you think about how this moves forward. And some of them, uh, for a mission-driven organization, um, I think need some consideration for the work that we do. Um, so, you know, to begin with, uh, you know, we are a receiver. Uh, we have done four cities in the four uh, single-family or two-family residences in the city of Holyoke. Um, since we've become involved with the pro uh, program. Uh, those are very successful. We're able to turn them over in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, we put the properties back into the hands of affordable homeowners after we're done with the process, which is central to our mission. Uh, that's not always what the outcome of a receivership is. Uh, but we've never done a multifamily receivership, and I doubt we'd ever touch one. Uh, and part of the reason for that is the economics of it. Uh, the only way we can do rehabilitation and stay solvent is to have a fairly deep level of subsidy. And finding those subsidies is actually very slow in coming, very time consuming, and very competitive. Uh, so, uh, you know, I have had numerous uh, times where there's been outreach from property owners, uh, from burnt up properties, abandoned buildings. They want to give us the property or sell it to us at a very favorable rate. They, they like what we do and, and want us to have it for that reason. Um, and I have to pass every single time because the time frame for actually rehabilitating a property is incredibly long. And when you have a long abandoned empty property, the scale of work that has to happen uh, is, is very, very slow. Uh, and I've learned this directly and the hard way. Uh, you know, we are doing rehabilitations on a multifamily now. Uh, I've made a, a pretty good spreadsheet out of it for my staff to show how we went from about a $450,000 project to a $700,000 project because of all the surprises that you encounter as you go through this process. And because that six units being real rehabilitated and, and we are at something just a little bit south of $120,000 a unit, um, we have to be subsidized or we're dead 
because even without earning a development fee, which we really need to keep our lights on, um, we have put more in this building than it's going to be economically worth the day we cut the ribbon. And why do we do that? Because it's central to our mission. Um, I went with Damian Cody, Paul Payer, Sean Gonsalves, and a few members of my staff down to Baltimore last uh, September, and we had an opportunity to participate in a vacant building <coughs> conference uh, that's hosted by an organization called the Center for Community Progress. Um, I highly commend any of you interested in this issue uh, to learn about this organization, read some of their materials, and understand that you are absolutely on target in terms of the physical and health harms that come with vacant properties, but it even goes beyond that. The sense of safety, the psychic damage to young children living in neighborhoods where they have to walk past empty and abandoned properties that give them the internal sense that they don't count, that's a reality every day for children in every neighborhood in Hoyoke, but particularly in our poorest neighborhoods. And yet, the economics of turning these blocks around is backwards. I can't do that for this city without some subsidized assistance. And that's just as true for folks in the private market. Uh, the best example of rehabilitated abandoned buildings I am aware of that's open today is the Hoyle Catholic Project done by Weld Management. That was 14 years waiting for a low-income tax credit. That's the kind of pace we're looking at. One of the things I would think about when you consider the punitive side of this is whether since 2009 it has effectively spurred development of these properties because I don't know of a lot of multifamilies that are now thoroughly refurbished and occupied that have formerly been vacant. And really the task I'm trying to work on as we take on these um, properties is with the single family or the one to four family homes, what can we do to shorten that period of time that nobody's living in the house in that neighborhood? Because they are of a scale where it's really workable. The city has really found a path where we can get in there, get court-ordered uh, remediation if the owners or the banks won't do it themselves. And that's happening, and it's getting done. But that hasn't been figured out with the multifamilies. And the economics of it, I will tell you, with a high degree of certainty, aren't going to get figured out. Because in the private market, they need the subsidies every bit as much as we do. Wealth management, it was a private vendor and a developer. So we want to do this work. We are actively involved in one. I came into a property. We're a property manager of about 300 units. Um, we're actually a fairly significant taxpayer in the city. We pay taxes on our real estate portfolio. It's over a quarter of a million dollars a year uh, that we pay into the city. Um, we had, when I came on board four years ago, 14 vacant units. I immediately made a priority of addressing those, but I have to take each one in turn. And here I am, almost four years in, just completing the first half of that problem. Six units, I've got another eight that I've got to address. I have been one of those guys who've appealed to come in with my lawyer. And, and I must say, uh, the Board of Health, I think, is burdened with something that raises a lot of questions they're not asked to think about very often. There does need to be some voice and understanding from folks on the development, on the building side of things, because that time frame really matters. You know, that four years, you're going to hit $6,000. It's just going to happen, because it's going to be very unlikely that you're going to go from obtaining a property to having a certificate of occupancy for a full rehab in this market within four years. I, I haven't heard of it being done. I'd love to see examples for multifamilies. Um, the other thing is, we are a mission-driven organization. We're a nonprofit. If you can put a proper roof on a property, if you can secure it well, if you can keep eyes on most of the time, you could bank properties like that with an organization like ours. But I can't even think about doing that and losing $6,000 a year on our relatively small budget. I'd have to start laying people off for the privilege of waiting till whenever for the subsidy I need to do work on those kind of properties. So my option, even though I know it's harming the children in our neighborhood, even though I know we'd be carrying out our mission much more effectively, is that I have to leave those properties alone. I can't touch them. If I have the title, I'm gonna owe that $6,000 a year. And I would wanna to talk to some realtors about this. I don't know that long vacant properties are actually very marketable in the private market right now. I, I, I'm not convinced of it. Uh, the one that I am absolutely going to refurbish 
as I am able. Um, I don't think I could sell that. Not, not at any real market value. Probably not enough to capture the taxes. I, we're current, trust me, and, and we keep it going. But if there was that issue, they get paid and you give it up for a buck. I, I really don't see a strong market for that sort of stuff. So that's an economic reality that's going on behind all that stuff. But I would say, especially for community development corporations, we're a nonprofit, we're here, we're well established in the city. One Holyoke is not the only one that operates in the city of Holyoke. You know that Library Commons has been long proposed, and you've seen the pace that's going on there. That's not their fault. That's the process um, for the former HAP housing of Wayfinder, now I think is the name. Um, so there is a certification process to become a community development corporation in Massachusetts, and we are one of a handful of organizations that have that status. I would suggest to you that certified community development corporations, if not nonprofit housing developers in general, should be exempt from this process and be held accountable in some other way if we actually decide we want to ignore our mission and start being irresponsible absentee landlords. I don't know of a nonprofit affordable housing organization that is intentionally doing any such thing. There are some in economic trouble that I think you would be a slightly different conversation. Um, question? Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, so Mike, thank you again. Uh, very extremely helpful. So for some of these properties that, you know, again, we look at it from some sort of reasonable lens of, you know, a couple of years or two years or three years, but it's seeming to say that you may need four, five, six, seven. Possibly heaven, a decade. A not, decade. Okay. Not even kidding. So, yeah. so wouldn't you agree that um, if you're as an organization, um, you know, you don't live in a, and you don't operate in a vacuum, obviously. You're operating in this community. You do a great job, and your organization is extremely well respected. Um, you know, if we can't really get to the property for 10 years, isn't it that is the point where you would say, you know, I probably should sell that one? Um, or, you know, in year one, and say, maybe you don't make, uh, you know, you, you just break even on the property or whatever. But, you know, in the meantime, you know, everybody that's around you has to look at it vacant for 10 years. Maybe it's just too big. I mean, you can't, you can't fry all the fish. You know what I'm saying? There's only so much capacity. Can I speak to my specific situation or would you like to speak more generally? Well, Cause, what, cause I am happy to speak. Uh, to it's not yes, a secret. And, We're a public uh, organization. Because it also yeah. goes to the point I made when I first spoke earlier on this topic, which is, there's only so much latitude we can give for great intentions. Yeah. There's got to be discernible, marketable progress on right. these things. Hope and aspiration based on prior, you know, well, I did 12 other properties, great. So if you just give me 10 more years on this one, I'll get it done. Don't you worry. I appreciate that, but we've had other people who have, you know, the dirt lot that's across from Mel's Restaurant, came in for votes to Hedic and all these organizations, and you give me this, and, and it's going to be great. And then, you know, eventually it was like, give me two more years, and then two more years, and, you know, and all these extensions had to be made. And, and in the end, I can't do it. But it was always my intent to do it. So, my so first of all, about, about the specifics that I'm dealing with. Yeah. So um, when I came in, we discovered that we had six empty units in an otherwise occupied building. That was a top priority for me. The other thing I had learned is that approximately a decade ago, the city had actually paid us to help take down the porches and close down a board of building on Northeast Street. And the reason was that the drug infestation in that particular neighborhood at that particular time was so out of control, it seemed to be the only way to bring the building back under control. Fast forward to 2013, I come in and I've inherited this. And also found that because of the challenge and regulatory world that rehabilitation is in, Old Hoyoke had not actually done a multifamily rehabilitation in several years. And so I come in and immediately realize, okay, these empty units are contrary to our mission. Cannot have it but immediately wanted to tackle the six units because there are other people living right next to them in the same building. That's worse. Right. So it did. It took me approximately six months to obtain the subsidy I needed through the Home Investment Partnership, and then the rest of the development tail evolves. We expect a certificate of occupancy at some point in May. That was 2014. 
I'm talking to you about May of 2017. We don't think we did it incompetently. We truly believe that is how difficult this work can be. In the meantime, what I have discovered is that funding source, that home investment partnership, it is diminished from what it had been about a decade ago. But the city gets about half of what it used to get. Um, the funds have already, for the most part, been allocated, as I understand it, to the Lyman Terrace project for the upcoming year. Uh, there has not been an RFP in over a year for funding of that kind, of that sort that's controlled by the city. Um, and so, you know, again, our game plan was, we're looking at probably an 18, 24 month project, then we'll move on to the next one. Now I'm looking at, well, it was a four year project. We've done a lot of work in the meantime. I am moving on that next building next, but um, my starting point is going to have to be a, an initial demolition permit, get back in there, make sure everything's cleaned up and proper, if that's even necessary. Probably build the porches on back of it because we can do that out of pocket. And then I have to find a third to 40% of what it costs to get that done. And if I'm in the same world that Dennis Walsh was in, I might be talking about 14 years before I get the LIDTEC that's going to give me that funding. I don't know if that's going to be appropriate for the community and reinvestment. I think not, because I'd have to ask for the whole thing. Don't think that's going to fly. Um, every source that I can look at is intensely competitive. We compete very well. We get grants. But I don't know that I have that today. It's going to get done but I cannot do it in a way it's gonna cost my employees their jobs, undermine our capacity to do the receiverships, to properly manage the rest of our properties or everything else. There is a box you kind of find yourself in. And I think that's true for private developers as well. So that's our specific situation right now. Mm -hmm. But I would also say for CDCs, I think there's a better remedy than this. Why are you draining the resources of small nonprofits that actually want to get this done? Why not instead have a specific reporting process for us. And if we can't get it done, make us deed it out to the next organization that can. I think that might be a fairer outcome and a more effective outcome for an organization like ours. So you're talking about taking the building? Yeah. Taking the building as opposed to le levying fines. So, you know, in the case, there's, not, there's just not a lot of us operating in the city of Holyoke. I think it would be manageable. And I think in this sort of situation, it would allow us to do our work or keep you informed as we have these situations. I would actually love to accept some of these multifamily properties and have the opportunity to maybe go for a larger low-income tax credit deal and, you know, do maybe 40, 50 units at once. That would be great. I actually can fix some of my own units that way. But and I'm you, in a different world than the private side. Is and are you I'm talking about an exemption from the vacant building fee? Is yeah. that what you're talking about? Yeah, that's exactly where I'm going. Because that cost to us is actually really meaningful to our solvency, not just our bottom line. And also means that that is why when an opportunity comes around where we could better secure, better plan for, try to do something with the next vacant building, right now I have to say no. We could be a good store, a good land bank, if you wish, if that sort of situation existed. Uh, so we're not, be, we're not looking for, we're looking for accountability in a way that makes sense for where we stand in this field, mm -hmm. not that we don't want to be accountable. Does, does one Hoyle pay for building permits? We do not. We have a special exemption for that. As a matter of fact, it's existed for about 40 years. And the theory and I think the reason that the city council even supported the renewal of that recently is that you're really taking money out of an organization the city's going to be giving money to later on. Where's the logic of that? So um, I think that we, we heard a lot of your points. Um, for me, I think that it's going to be a hard pill to swaddle to create an exemption like that when you are getting exemptions to uh, uh, building permits and whatnot, but I think that we could revisit the definition of vacant versus blighted and figure out some, um, some, some clarification for when these types of fees get, get levied. Um, we do have a couple of other speakers who want to um, speak this evening, and we have another um, several items on the agenda, so I want to um, keep the public speaking process moving along. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> My name Nate. is Glenn Shealy. I'll be very brief. I'm 48 Holy Family Road in Holyoke. Um, I'm the manager of Quantum Properties along Water Street. 
Um, we've invested in a significant amount of dilapidated mill properties, specifically 17 and a half acres from 14 to 28 Water Street. Uh, we went before the Historic Commission for a plan to demolish all these buildings. I think we've been very upfront about what, what our plan is with the city. Um, we have one particular building we've been assessed for that's very unusual. It's not a black and white building. It's partially occupied by Holyoke Gas and Electric that until just recently has not made any move to move out of the building. So we have turbines, generators, electrical systems and everything in the building. Also, when we went to the building department prior to the present building inspector, we went for build demolition permits on the entire complex and were told we had to go one building at a time, which we have done. Subsequently, there are other reasons we can't necessarily pull building permits on everything. Mass DEP has prohibited us from doing the asbestos abatement in one of the buildings because we were doing too many asbestos abatements in the buildings and they didn't want a third building under an asbestos abatement. Well, you can't get a building permit without an asbestos abatement. So we're blocked on that measure. We are making significant progress, I believe, on the, on the whole project, but this one particular building, when we initially responded to the Board of Health to say this was not an empty building, that it was occupied by Holyoke Gas and Electric, and that Mass DEP had us consolidate our asbestos collection ap apparatus in the building, we didn't hear back and I did not know of the appeals process. The second year, I sent a copy of the letter back basically saying nothing's changed. Third year, I get a $9,000 bill from the city. Um, for me, I think there are good actors in the city and there are bad actors. I know Councilor Jourdain would like a black and white test, but I believe you have to look at the intention of some of the people that have come into the city. I have literally spent millions of dollars on this piece of property. A $9,000 fine is a slap in the face. And I think you also have to be aware, of, a little cautious about what you wish for, because I think these fines add up so quickly, the bad actors just aren't gonna pay them. And what's going to happen is the bad actors are going to constantly accrue more and more fines, and the city's going to have to own these properties. For instance, 1 Cabot Street, 37 Appleton, 30 John Street, all these pro and the numerous others I've looked at as well within the city, they get so deep into the back taxes and municipal lien charges that nobody can touch them. And a fellow like Mike Moriarty, who may have every intention in the world to rehab something, can't afford to pay off the municipal lien charges because it's just too expensive. The property is outstripped the value just by the charges to the city. Then the city ends up owning it and you get into the Essex House scenario. I know Pleasant Street's come up several times. I don't think this ordinance even touches Pleasant Street because it's vacant land. There's no building on it, but maybe I'm incorrect. But I think there has to be sort of a little finesse to the statute um, that doesn't catch but I, I consider myself a good actor, and it, maybe that's a tough one to define in this kind of statute, but we have our property totally fenced off. We're working there six days a week. We work on the entire parcel. Um, we're not going away. I've been there since 2009. We acquired them in 2010 with the full intent to demolish everything on the site except one historic facade, and we will finish the project, but the, the fines don't help. So I would ask somehow a definition be crafted. I know it's a tough one, but crafted such that not everybody gets trapped that shouldn't be trapped. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we encapsulate that into the definition of vacant versus blighted. I, I think that's the solution to your situation. Um, but I assure you that we've tried the non-ordinance approach to this for 40 years. And so the case study from 1970 to 2009 was let the market dictate they'll figure it out and we did it the old-fashioned way supply and demand and um, what was the result of that process for 40 years a, a, a creation of in Holyoke which I suggest to you you didn't have 240 vacant properties in 1970 
in the city of Holyoke. I assure you that. And if you look at it today, despite how many have been demolished, by the way, we're, we've had a demolish spree that I've witnessed for the last couple decades here. Um, despite that, we still have all of these, and we're now up to 240 growing. So the point that it's at epidemic stage, I think, is empirical that we needed a change of course so that we create incentives to the market. Um, just hoping on the best wishes of everybody um, is simply not going to work anymore. And um, But I think situations like what you're describing of you're actively working on the property, I think it's quite obvious. Um, I think you would fall under what we're, we're envisioning. Um, but on the other hand, there's enough to chase that we need to not wait until they become the, uh, you know, 10 years vacant and then we decide to to go after these this with this ordinance Clen, is hand in hand a entirely proactive approach maybe the city's not ready for it maybe we just maybe the answer is we just can't do it i don't know what the I, but i can't create incentive to government but what i can say is the solution stands before us the solution is create disincentives so the market does as much of this house cleaning as possible on their own because left to its own devices i have 40 years of empirical evidence that suggest the market alone will not do it so we've created an 09 and a disincentive now we've looked at it to see how much has it been really vigorously enforced so we created to double the fines now the city needs and which is starting with the receivership program to go one step further tax titles early receiverships and housing court boom 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 when these buildings have real viability the building isn't vacant 10 years it's maybe vacant six months the last tenant moved out and the landlord has left it now we're johnny on the spot we're right on it because they're registering and we know about it i do agree except i see groups like mike for instance who could use his capability to rehab properties as a community yeah. development corporation. But for every Mike, there's 10 non-Mikes. The problem is we don't need to worry about Mike. we got to worry about the 10 non-Mikes. No, but there and will be properties that Mike could get that because of the lien you're going to impose, he won't touch. Or I won't say personally he won't touch, but groups like Mike's won't touch. I don't know what Mike's selection The groups project. like Mike are not going to save this city. It's going to be the private sector that will save the city. It's going to be private industry that is uh, or private capital that's going to come in here and either purchase these apartment blocks uh, and these other vacant properties uh, I think you're already doing really well when I first came to we're the not city, doing really well I you assure had you places like 30 John Street that for 19 years had unpaid taxes now that doesn't happen in the city you're much more proactive you're getting after tax titles you're starting to put pressure on in the tax title area I'm not sure you have to just muscle people to the ground with a with an additional fine of six thousand dollars a year. That's all. But let's uh, um, keep the public um, comment going. Council Sullivan, do you want to say anything, or should we I'll let I'll the wait till the public comments? Yeah. Thanks, um, Mr. Virgilio. You come to the microphone. Just state your name and address. Uh, Gregory Virgilio. I live at seven thirty three High Street, apartment four R. I've lived uh, in Holyoke about 10 years. I purchased my first building in Holyoke in 1984, so I've been a real estate owner in Holyoke for close to 35 years, I guess. Um, and during that time, I have to say that uh, Holyoke has clawed its way tooth and nail back from the 1960s when it was a burgeoning industrial city. Today, our vacancy rate is lower than it has been in 30 years. I've got essentially no vacancies in my apartments right now. Now, what that says is that these 240 vacant houses could potentially and probably will be uh, rehabbed into useful housing because the market is going, if it continues, and you know I understand the cyclical nature of the housing market, if it continues, these could potentially be houses for you know, families. Uh, do you mind just bringing the microphone a little bit closer to you, so that we're? Do you mind turning the microphone closer to your to your mouth, so we're picking you up a yeah, bit more? I'm sorry. Um, so the idea is to create a disincentive uh, to to uh, hold these units vacant, create an incentive to rehab them. And uh, Councillor Jordan, I think you really said it when you know uh, the nonprofits are not going to do that with these 240 units. It's going to be the private individual investor 
that's going to make the difference. And what you've got to do is create that incentive, get them uh, into the rehab mode, okay, uh, and uh, you know get them out of the you know get them out of the vacancy mode. Um, so how do you do that effectively? First of all, I, I think what you've got is a good plan. I, I think what you're going through is growing pains because I will say that this uh, uh, vacant building fee has not been um, implemented uniformly over you know, the last uh, eight years. Uh, in fact, um, it, it's been you know, pretty sp sporadically enforced. And I think it's a good thing now that it's really coming up to, you know, getting up to speed. Uh, and these are growing pains that you're going to have to, uh, you know, uh, work through. Uh, I think the appeal process is going to be important, and I think it's important that you develop the criteria by which an appeal is allowed or denied in writing so that, you know, you don't get these lawsuits. I know from my own experience that having uh, criteria in writing is essential uh, so that you can tell somebody when they're denied, why they're denied, and they can understand that. Um, and uh, so I don't want to repeat everything that everybody's already said, um, but I think it's a good thing. Now, my own experience at 185 Pine Street, which is a vacant building, i had been built, built vacant for 30 years. I purchased it last year, and I have an ounce, uh, I paid a $4,300 building permit fee for a building permit on the building. I paid a $1,500 electrical permit fee for an electrical permit. Um, and uh, we're making progress on the building. Uh, it's, uh, I'm not a nonprofit, you know. I've been in business for 30 years, and I'm a for-profit company. Uh, I'm doing it uh, for two reasons. One, I think it's a beautiful building. And the second is I hope someday to make some money on it, okay? And I think there are other investors out there, just like myself, on a smaller scale that can buy a two-family house and make a go of it. And I think that's what you want to do. Now, as far as the disincentive goes, I think you have to work, and uh, the problem properties group ought to play a part in this. You ought to take some of that money that you're getting from these fees and put it into the problem properties group. You ought to staff it at a, uh, at a, at a, a level necessary to do the policing that's required, to do the administrative work that's required, and use those fees in that way, I think. The, furthermore, I think you, you need to uh, you know, develop a receivership program in this city. Now, Mike said you know, he, he's been a receiver. I, I've been a receiver for, I was probably one of the first receivers in Western Massachusetts in 1992 under a Brashkin um, when we took over the property on the corner of uh, Maple and, and uh, Sergeant Street. Uh, so I, I think receiverships can really be beneficial, and you need to be able to um, move a property uh, if it has that potential into receivership quickly so that that property can be uh, uh, protected um, and, pr and brought back on the market. And I, that's happened in a number of cases in my receiverships where those properties have been brought back onto the market. Uh, so I think if you develop that plan, uh, it can work. Um, the other thing is I haven't paid a vacant building fee on 185 Pine Street because I do have an open building permit. I do have a rehab plan that I've gone over with uh, uh, Building Commissioner Cody. Uh, so I haven't paid any vacant building fees. Lucky me. <laughs> I guess that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to speak from the public? No? Okay. Um, Councillor Sullivan, and I think we're going to start to wrap it up then. Yep. Uh, just to wrap it up. Now, hearing from four great developers in town, right, without taking any of the teeth out of the current ordinance, without lowering the fines, just by establishing a good appeals board and the problem properties, from what I hear of it right now, we got all the right people there in place. Even, even if the developers had to go in front of it every year for 10 years, you've got the right people that can say, yes, I see the progress that was made in the last 12 months, good luck, you know, here's your waiver and get on with it, hope we don't see you again next year. 
next year comes around, nothing's happened. Oh, well, we got a different story here now. Now you can change it. It's still progressing, or you know, we're you can show the paperwork. You know, we've got all this in for the grant, whether it's for grants, whether it's tied up for other reasons, the massive size of it. Uh, other other government regulatory holdups, whether you know city departments, anything. We got the right people. The board's composed of the right people to make this decision, and to me, it solves every one of these problems without taking any teeth out of out of the uh, out of the uh, regulation. Yeah, to me, it's just a matter of um, adding adding additional language to clarify who's doing what, what the criteria criteria are for for an appeals for um, who would be um, subject to this type of fine um, and then also I don't think that it's um, been applied evenly because I think it's unclear how you actually um, can get a um, approved building plan um, so those are those are some concerns yeah that I think will, would need to be spelled out in a draft ordinance that we, we revisit um, Paul I know you wanted to say a few things also uh, thank you, Councilor Leesley, and that's well summarized. Uh, just very briefly, uh, 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 we do currently have a process, uh, and it's really improved over the last couple of years, really the last year or so, uh, to monitor administrative rehab plans, so instead of bringing a property through housing court, but also to give a property owner a chance outside of housing court, and if they fail, uh, it's very persuasive evidence for appointing a receiver. Uh, but the Board of Health and the Building Department has uh, gotten familiar with the process of approving a rehab plan and then every few months conducting an inspection. So I think if that's the direction the council wanted to go, uh, go in, uh, it would be something that, as Councilor Sullivan uh, was describing, uh, there would be that opportunity to have follow through to make sure that uh, if we are uh, exempting or defining certain uh, vacant properties where activity is ongoing um, as, as not subject to the fee, there would be a mechanism in place to uh, administratively do that. I just wanted to provide the council with that information. So based on what you heard um, today, Paul? Got some writing to do. You think you could um, draft some suggestions for um, the changes that we'd like to see and um, maybe we could revisit it in another, I don't know. Well, why don't, we, month? Well, why, why don't we make a motion at some point to, uh, uh, well, I'll make the motion now that we just make some suggestions. You want to, you, yeah. you, have, you have some, Kevin, you want to make? Or? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I think we take the current ordinance. Uh, we put, uh, let's begin a red line. And, um, and I, I think some of the things that we heard is uh, one was the suggestion of uh, relative to the appeal process. I think we're going to um, spell out the, um, appeal criteria. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that I heard today was that there may be for a approved rehab plan. So I think we're going to need a definition section on what a rehab plan is. Um, that that would be a grounds if you have an approved one. So we could put that in the red line. I think I also heard that the um, appeal board yep. is going to be at least at first blush, maybe at least if nothing else is a placeholder, the building commissioner, board of health commissioner, and the, the uh, associate city solicitor in charge of. Um, city, the, city, city solicitor designee. Yeah, city solicitor designee, that type of. Um, and then maybe with advice from uh, the problem property committee also. Fire, fire department, police yeah, department. Yeah, maybe with. Uh, consultation with them as well and I assume they're a member of that um, I believe we spoke to um, if somebody has an accepted or approved rehab plan that that could be a grounds in the appeal process to restart the uh, tolling if you will uh, to Mr. Schrader's point of that you become if you approve that one of the things that the appeal board could also grant you is sort of restart the clock so you're back to day one, as opposed to you purchased the property, it's been vacant 10 years, and you're starting as this if it was vacant for 10 years. Um, so I think that, that was one of the things that I heard today. Um, and I think we also want to revisit um, the definitions for vacant property versus blighted property. Yes, yep, yep, exactly. And that'll help us to 
solve these conundrums. But actually, if we have the, if you have an approved rehab plan, that's going to get you over the threshold of being, you could be vacant, but you're vacant with an approved rehab plan. So that might be the other way around it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and then the question is, you know, we may want to put in a duration that says, you know, the building commissioner or this, uh, the building commissioner has to renew or approve this rehab plan every year. Right. And yeah. then this gives him an enforcement mechanism to, to monitor and, and measure material improvement in the plan. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to give them the same story with excuses every year. Um, um, and I think to um, the other point that um, Mr. Schrader, Schrader? Schneider. Schneider Schneider made was that um, the fees, so if the property has been vacant for 10 years, you shouldn't start in year one that you purchased the building at year 11 and the fees that are being accrued. Um, and that I think that to the yeah. points that was made earlier, that that should be something that's negotiated in, in the purchase and sale. I'm sorry, could you just clear? So the point being that uh, if somebody purchased property, liability for prior prior fees? So I think we want to separate se separate out um, the liability for prior fees, I think is something that needs to be negotiated in the purchase and sale, as opposed to the way that we start the clock on the number of years that the property has been vacant. So that would be in the appeal process would be as far as what's owed in the past, they're just going to have to figure that out with the seller. But as far as if they get an approved plan, then that would also have to give some sort of dispensation to also allow you to go back to say your year one again. But even if they weren't, in, even if they didn't get the even approved if they plan, in year one. well, even if, yes. So even if they're in year one of when they took the building, yes. Um, without the without an approved plan because the approved plan is going to um, create an exemption but even without the approved plan I think that we should restart the clock on on that new property as opposed to being 10 years vacant with property owner and then the new property owner takes it in year one you're in year 11 the the fees that are owed need to be part of a purchase and sale agreement between the property owners because they they, they should be leaned onto the property in some way and not carried over um, by by the city assessing additional fees. And that's you, correct. You know that that wouldn't there? happen now. And, and to it council, doesn't happen now. It, it wouldn't. So if you, I mean, this is the first year that we've leaned uh, vacant building registration fees. Uh, so it, it's it's uh, as Councilor Bartley uh, accurately pointed out, it's never shown up on an MLC. What will be good going forward, and it bears on this point, is that. Uh, billing for one of the major challenges with implementation, and I, I give a great amount of credit to the Board of Health uh, in, in their uh, efforts to do billing statements every year, uh, but the paperwork, the administrative process for this is, is burdensome. Uh, beginning this year, we'll have a MUNIS, we'll have a general billing module, so when you go um, to pull an MLC, if that registration fee has been assessed, October 15th of each year that will show up and uh, exactly as Council Lisi pointed out that would be something that would naturally be negotiated as part of the uh, the purchase and sale right now that's not happening because there's no way for a buyer to know unless there's been liens which there haven't been um, so, so really that money just yeah well wait a minute so can't you put those on a municipal lien certificate they are starting to do that now it hasn't been done previously before this year it will now be entered in MUNIS. So the billing statements will actually be a little bit easier for the Board of Health because everything will be going through, similar to like a parking ticket. Uh, we'll be able to just punch in uh, the amount owed on the tax bill, uh, print it out, send it out, uh, and that's gonna help the market respond to these more accurately. And I think if we're more aggressive in these collections and doing these type of additional measures, we'll be able to have funding to fund a position that will help with the administrative burden of some of all of this and to help with the enforcement we have I mean, that recorded <laughs> absolutely <laughs> to do inspections i mean th this is this is a great return on investment absolutely here. i mean it well, really now, Kevin, can, can we now uh by ordinance direct where the fees are to be appropriated or is that not possible no i don't think we can do that because can. i think it would creep on the mayor's authority to appropriate the budget but what we could say is we could create a position 
already by ordinance, but you know we haven't had tremendous success in that regard either. We funded Councilor Sullivan. The council approved the creation of uh, some new positions on demolition stuff, and then they went unfunded. Uh, well, they actually were funded. They went unfilled. So you know, we'll we shall see. But uh, nevertheless, that would certainly be, I think warmly received here paul if you and, want to get that counselor to uh, I, I know we're running late on time and as brian knows i could just go on and on and on about this <laughs> uh but there there is a revolving fund that i believe the council approved we a couple months it. ago mm -hmm. uh and that would not be under the current setup of it uh would not be uh able to be used for uh funding salaries but under the state law if the council wanted to include that sort of expenditure they'd be able to up to a certain percentage i think of, of the overall so that's and again well, all let of, us know follow up with us on that yeah absolutely all, all of these things too i you know uh, this has been very helpful because in a lot of ways the the, the city hall is sort of the fulcrum of, of of these things happening on both sides uh implementation is very messy uh so i think this process is actually playing out in a very productive way uh all of the comments that the property owners i i, I agree with at least some aspect of everything that's been said uh, by everybody today. So I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to writing up a uh, proposed uh, language, perhaps with some options to uh, kick the uh, decisions to the That'd decision makers. Okay, so I'll make a motion to table these items. Uh, um, yeah. Councilor Sullivan did want to make um, one final comment before we table. Yeah, and this would be um, for, for legal also. This definition between vacant and blighted, I, I can tell you there's been a lot of um, discussion about the 240 properties and the 240 properties are not all houses I can tell you this much that not all of the uh, vacant houses are blighted I think I would be safe in saying that 99% of the vacant industrial buildings uh, um, vacant apartment buildings in Hoyoke are blighted all right so you've you've, you've got to be careful with that we got Vacant industrial buildings; those are all blighted, all right. But we don't. We got to be careful how we, how we craft this. Well, maybe what we do you is know. we just say, if you don't come in for a rehab plan, then sorry for you, right. you're out of luck. You, you got to step forward and say, this is specifically what I'm doing. Right. The building right, commissioner right, right. says yes, and now we will begin to track your progress. If you don't do that, yeah. 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 Absolutely. It, so, yeah. Great. So then on the motion to table. Uh, oh, okay. So, uh, so refer to le keep it on the table, but refer legal to, okay, uh, perfect. to do a draft ordinance. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. All right. All Thank you. So that's so moved. <laughs> All in favor. Uh, Aye. So moved. I make a motion to suspend the rules to go to item 11 second. relative to uh, Courser and Isabella Street. Motion made and seconded. All in favor. Aye. Aye. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Item 11 is an item filed by Councilor Jordan um, that the DPW post no parking signs on the easterly side of Isabella Street from 200 feet north of the intersection of Isabella and Crozier to 80 feet north of 4 Ave. Mike, this is uh, your, your item. We'll get, try to get you out of here quickly now, now that you waited <laughs> all night. Yeah. We have a distinguished guest. We have the principal of First Lutheran School in the house as well. So we'd like to thank her for coming as well. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Mike, so give us your thoughts on why these additional no parking signs would be beneficial to the, to the area there. Uh, it would improve traffic flow in and out of the parking lot for the uh, First Lutheran Church and School. Okay. So just so we're clear, kind of like w point out now uh, where exactly those would be. So we're looking at, so Il Isabella runs right behind the school and the church. We have the synagogue is at four and um, Isabella. So I thought recently we did just put some stop sign at four and Isabella recently. So now this would be another one going the other direction perhaps or? Well, not a, a stop sign, no it's a no signs. parking sign. Oh, no parking signs, okay. So Isabella is in between the church and the large parking parking lot behind the Holyoke Hospital. Okay, so this is so this is going to basically be no parking on Isabella Street for that. No side. parking, 
Correct. Yeah. All right. uh, there's currently no parking on the west side, which okay. is the church side. Got it. This would be no parking on the east side. So this is, must be hospital folks that are parking over there, right, you think, or uh, likely? It could be hospital folks. There's been construction. I see the principal shaking her head. I'm assuming, I mean, who else would be parking there, really, right? Patients. Patients. Yeah, but that's hospital drive. 10 Hospital Drive. There's also a clinic at the end of Isabella Street that has its own parking lot. And there may be some overflow parking from that. Okay. Uh, but, but it's causing was, problems with getting in and out of the school and uh, buses and things? or And it's not school parking. Uh, the school oh, they have parking their own is lot, well right, yeah. contained in their lot. Is the area needed for um, drop off and pickup, or d should it really be um, dedicated no parking? That'd be so question. under a suspension of the rules. Second. All, oh, yeah. all in favor? Aye. Um, do you mind addressing us at the microphone? Um, name and address for the record, please. Mary Ann Bischoff, 379 Linden Street here in Holyoke. Thank you. Um, so on Isabella, where we're talking about putting up these uh, no parking signs, is the area needed for pick up and drop off of students or, or should it be a dedicated no parking area? The reason that I um, talked to Mr. McManus to begin the process was to be no parking. Um, as far as our car line, we have no bus service for First Lutheran, so it's all parent pickup. Mm -hmm. And they come at the end of school, line up and four come around the corner in the parking lot and then out. So it wouldn't be on that side of the street anyhow? No. The, the problem that, and what brought this to the forefront and why I wanted to address this was when I saw a fire truck trying to get around the corner from four on to Isabella, they couldn't do it because of the parked cars. And so here's a school full of children and if a fire truck is needed, they can't get around the corner and that was before the snow. The snow was its own issue which of course is temporary but yet we almost had our first accident when the snow, the first after the first snowfall. And, and even for the people leaving the hospital parking lot, because there's the one exit entrance onto Isabella, um, when cars are parked on the east side, they can't always see either. And especially when you're going toward Courser, and there's cars parked along the east side of Isabella, it's hardly room for two cars to even pass. Now I also realize that because of the construction of the hospital, that has impacted this problem. And of course, in a sense, that's temporary, but I don't know yet where all these cars are gonna go for the hospital, because they've been working very hard to keep making parking spaces and parking lots, and I'm, we're very grateful for that. But this is also the first year where we have had so many people park in our parking lot. And we would love to help them, but it's a school, and we don't know who's parking. And to keep the safety of the children in mind, mm -hmm. we, um, we've created <laughs> little tickets we put under the windshield and give them grace, because we are Christians, <laughs> so we'll <laughs> give them grace one time. But the signs do say cars will be towed at owner's expense, and now this is the first where we've hired a, um, we, we didn't have to pay f for this, but we've um, signed a contract with Hampshire Towing because people were still coming back and parking, and we can't have it. Sure. And we've had... The strange situation also, and I don't even know why people do this, they come around four into our parking lot, through the parking lot, out the exit, and continue down Isabella. <laughs> that one's a mystery to me, because I don't know that that has anything to do with parking, but um, that happens all the time too. So that's why I presented this, especially when I saw the fire truck. That clenched it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Council Bartley wanted to speak. Yeah, you pretty much answered my, my first question about people um, probably par parking in your lot that, that shouldn't, shouldn't be there. So with, with school coming to an end right. and, and with construction, looks like that's coming to a conclusion. What's now, your... See, yeah, that was my... That's what, the one 
hole in this is because I realized that schools open from August through June, and now we've got July, August. So if the ordinance goes up and there's no parking, then the, you know. Yeah, so Mr. Bishop, I guess what I was, because I, I, I drive through there uh, you know, fairly regularly up a hospital drive to the United Bank, mm -hmm. and I, I see the, the throngs of cars um, there, and it's really a, um, yeah, it's a public safety potential issue, right? Um, so, uh, so I, I don't, I don't know how we could. I mean, I, I guess I would want to hear from the from the hospital. Um, I mean, I, I'm some more than sympathetic, and and I'm. My opinion is that we should probably support this to some extent to find some kind of uh, you know to make sure you have lines of sight improved at those stop signs and 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 so f and at the various intersections, especially for the children, for heaven's sake. So we want to do that, but I guess I'd want to. I, I guess I'd want to hear a little bit from them as so far as their timing is concerned. So I have to say that even before the construction began, this is the situation. The parking is on Isabella. Yeah. Because employees, I know for for a while I thought that would be alleviated by the new parking areas that they built recently, but that hasn't changed. And I have to say Carl Cameron, I've he's I I give him credit. He's worked well. Um, we've worked well together. If I, because before Christmas, I shared with him that we had all the um, men who were working, all their trucks were on Isabella. So now they were there definitely all day. It wasn't even now that there would be some coming and going. And he said he had a plan to, that he was putting in action, and whatever he did worked because it's now with back. It's just back to cars. So, so Mike, what, what's your sense of this at this point? Where, where is Holyoke Medical in their in their process, and uh, and what, what what's your recommendation? You know, so I'm not give, I'm not sure factors. where they are with construction, um, but I think. Uh, Historically, there has been parking on Isabella. What this would be is, is for no parking zone in the vicinity of the school well, parking I, lot. So this is a 120-foot section of no cars, so basically it well, would eliminate about, say, 10 parking spots. Right. There's still, there still would be parking on Isabella uh, in the vicinity yeah. Yeah, of so Hospital I, Drive. I, I, I'm, I'm ready to make a motion that we you know, lay out the measurements, but you know, so you can, why don't you bring it back to us, but in the meantime, maybe we can, can we communicate that to Mr. Cameron somehow that we're about to, that we'd like to do this. Can you give us some feedback, Mr. Cameron, as to where the medical center is and, and its process? Maybe we get some feedback from the folks that run two hospital and ten hospital drive. Sure. Yeah, um, we, can, we can make those. Mainly ten hospital drive, not two hospitals. They have two hospitals in their own parking lots, right, so they're all good to go. But ten hospital drive, there's no doubt that, that all the patients going in and out of there, uh, they're, they're, they're swarming. Isabella Street and that parking lot. There's no question that's happening. So, um, but so I'm of the opinion that uh, I'll make a motion now that you you you, know, you lay out the measurements um, and come back to us with a uh, with a potential order so then we we can table until such time. Second. All in favor? Aye. So moved. Okay, Mr. Bishop, do you understand what we just did? I'm not sure. What, the time, <laughs> what does that mean for time? It's approved. It's okay. It, 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 to it, to it's draw a, it into measurements. Yeah, we're, we're going to draw it to measurements, but in the meantime, Mr. McManus is going to communicate right. these on these proceedings to his, his colleague, Mr. Mr. Cameron, and uh, to his friend, Mr. Cameron, I should say, and that we will um, we'll get we'll get some feedback. So we'll he'll come back to us. Yeah, generally, he, Mike comes into us. Uh, I think the chair puts Mike on it at the end of end of the month. So probably the second meeting in May, Mike will be back. Uh, so hopefully we can take this up at that point and okay. we can proceed from there. Do I need to be back for the meeting? Uh, you know what? Uh, I, I would want to, you know, you should be you, get in touch with uh, Councilor Jourdain and he'll, he'll so advise you of that, okay? Very good. I thank you for your quick replies too. And Happy Mr. to. That's what he does. Oh. So He's quick. Uh, can we take up number five, please? Unless, is there anything else from Mike? No, I don't think so. Oh, okay. So motion to take five off the table. Second. There was. Uh, oh, oh. Thank you. Thank you. I wasn't, I wasn't familiar with it. Which one? Number the, six. Oh, six. And it, has, take... it has DPW in the order. And park oh. and rec. And is that what Terry is here for? That's what Terry was here for. Did she leave? 
think I know. I think I hear a voice out there. Yeah. One second, number six, on out of order. Yeah, motion is to suspend the rules to take up item second. six now. Motion made and seconded to take up item number six out of order. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. Um, the, item six reads um, that the vendor the permit ordinance be amended to specify, I'm sorry, specifically address the process for obtaining the permit. Which department will issue such permits and how to track and maintain information on such vendors slash supporters? Uh, currently, a vendor was fingerprinted as part of the vendor permit process and was sent to several departments to obtain a permit, and no one had any idea of the permit, thus the need for a process. Therefore, vendor permits should be issued by DPW or Parks and Rec with approval form from the um, Board of Health and Treasurer's Office. So under discussion, since Councilor McGee is not here, I'm going to defer to um, the department heads. Uh, so the, the city does have a lot of different um, permits and licenses and various boards who issue those permits and licenses. There's uh, Parks and Rec, Board of Health, DPW, but there's also the clerks. There's licensing. Um, help me out who am I? I know I'm missing a lot. There's the fire department, police department, yep. building commissioner. Well, they, they hand out permits. Different permits. Oh, yeah. Permits throughout the city? Oh. Throughout the city. Everybody's got a permit. Yeah. Uh, Don't say where you talking about. Hello. Uh, <laughs> so I know about a month and a half ago, uh, there was a meeting uh, within the city to try to streamline the permitting process uh, to get the permits online. There was even talk about having a permitting docent, if you will, someone who would uh, be the, the first line of response when somebody comes with an issue. Oh, like and then the ombuds person that I filed? Pardon me? <laughs> that like the om ombuds person order that I filed? Exactly. Uh, so this... Uh, this is in the works. Um, I'm not sure what stage it's in right now. We're, I know we were trying to select a software to use for uh, a permitting database. So within City Hall, there's actually additional movement um, since we haven't had much movement on the ordinance front for creating that type of position. But there's um, an, an effort to try to coordinate who's doing what permits and to get a like central central command of what type of permits are offered, who's responsible for them, and and who is going to be um, helping that the applicant through right. the process. Right. Mm -hmm. And and the the point of contact would be Eileen Pooler. Uh, she's been the one who's been trying to carry the water for this. Mm -hmm. uh, but there there and there is a lot of uh, cross referencing of permits. So if you wanted to have a uh, uh, a deep fry food truck. You know, you would need a permit from uh, DPW, Board of Health, the fire department, um, and that ombudsman would would help streamline the process. Yeah, you'd also need uh, have to come to this body too, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. See, that's why you need the person because no one can keep track of everything. So, is Eileen Pooler the one that's creating the like inventory of all the different permits that are out there, and who um, you have to talk to to get those permits? Uh, she was working uh, with Heather in the mayor's office to do Perfect. that. Just, I think, just to get the information of what right. permits are issued right. and why. In the microphone. Oh, I think they were just doing what permits are issued by each department and why. I don't know if it went right, but that was that. Uh, almost the framework for the the process. Yeah, I, I do think it's a good process to um, begin. I think that um, in terms of expediting permitting and making ourselves, um, you know, friendly to businesses, people that want to do work in the city, uh, make improvements, and you know, move move their move their goods and services forward. Um, if we can have a grasp, if the city could have a grasp itself of what the permits are, you know, what the requirements are, who's issuing them, and, and the other uh, departments that are involved, I think that would be um, a really a really great um, start. Because I know I've heard stories of people going to the clerk's office, they need permit X, and they're like, we don't understand what you're talking about because they don't deal with that permit. And so there are these blind spots from department to department um, and the public doesn't know 
exactly where to go. And I think that even, even within City Hall, there's uh, not a clear understanding of who's issuing what permits and where you need to go to, to get all the appropriate sign-offs. Um, so to create that inventory would be a really great first start. Um, and then everybody, every office should have that um, list available so that any citizen could come into you know, City Hall and say, I'm trying to get this done, and then they could be you know, directed to um, the proper department in the absence of an um, ombuds person, which would really be a wonderful tool to help walk people and, and do some hand-holding and, and really create some, you know, uh, I guess, constituent service um, in terms of, of moving that process forward. Council Bartley, did you want to speak? No. no. So what does everybody think um, about the order that's before us right now? It seems like there is some, I mean, to me, it's like the preliminary work of just having the inventory of what's out there is, it's like the, the foundation of all the work that's going to, that, that, would, that would come next. Years ago, they had a, uh, the sign off list, we called it, for a business certificate. And it was confusing. And it, Brenna ended up just, she just issues a business certificate. I don't even think we have sign offs anymore. We don't have the sign offs anymore. So it sounds like we're kind of going back to it. And it was, it's, it was real confusing for people. Uh, I don't know if we, we're so we, much going back we to we it were, as it, trying to figure out who's doing what. And then per perhaps taking a look at what the inventory is and figuring out how to consolidate some of those requirements. I didn't even know what this was about. I was talking about somebody being fingerprinted. Uh, I don't. Or the health sent them to the police department. I don't know either why Park and Rec is and, here. And so I didn't realize what was going on. Now I I know what you're talking about. Um, and I, I think what the the goal would be is if uh, you come to the city and you say I want to open a, a nail salon. That there would be a checklist of these are the permits that you need this is where you would go to get these permits and if you if you wanted to open a car wash it would be something totally different but you would still one person know given that information out it would be one person giving that information out or a food truck or, or a food truck or uh, a B&B <laughs> So, so it, so it, it, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So Ms. Pooler is the one. She's, she's been coordinating this. She's, uh, because what? there's a, a, and what office a database. Is she, what office is she in? Where, where is her map. office? She's a map. Across from the mayor's office? Yes. So it's, it's more of a, a database management type thing that this software, uh, would be, would be performing. The database would be all of the the various permits that the city has, and then uh, figuring out which permits are needed for any any situation. So, Mike, where is she in the process? Is she almost done, or, or where? What's where is she? Uh, no. Well, I'd, it wouldn't be fair of me to say where she is in the process. Well, who's managing? Who's managing her on this? I'm not sure. Okay, so what do you want us to do with this order? Do you want us to do you want us to table this thing to have them, have her come back in a month, or, or what, what do you think? Well, it was it was filed in August, um, so if we give a, a couple more months, there should be more progress. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll motion to table. Sorry. Does anyone else have anything else to chime in on this before oh, we table sorry. it? I mean, just because you were here for most of the night, do you have anything else that you want to add to the conversation? <laughs> I don't understand. Actually, I really don't understand that order because there's there's three departments here. I, I really don't know why Park and Rec is here, but shouldn't the building department and the city clerks? Yeah, the more I relevant think, ones should yeah. be here. It's probably and that I mean, this one instance triggered something between those three departments, and they highlighted the, the larger problem that we're trying to get at with this inventory. Yeah, I mean, obviously the council wrote this for a reason. He wrote it out because something happened and it triggered it but you know terry going forward if this we bring this up again you know why don't you just talk to linda or rebecca whoever's chairing the meeting and why don't you just just ascertain whether or not you need to attend you know prior to spending i did night. that's fine or send a letter and actually Even something better, that send you letter, said send a letter with your fees 
That would be yeah, with some uh, statistical data. Yeah, forward it to Miss Pooler and have her <laughs> deal with it. Um, the other, one thing that Rebecca said, it would be nice if everyone could be versed on what other city departments do, but that's probably not going to happen. Wow, we could. Have, you're, you're talking like a retreat. We too don't. Much, yeah, too much should, knowledge. We should have like it a retreat nice, or something like that. Let's go to like. A, I don't know. Let's go somewhere somewhere nice. So like the whole operating city. Operating so have... efficiently right now, not knowing what we're doing. <laughs> if we actually started knowing what we're doing, just you know, because I, I, I can't, I can't again. I can't compliment that gorgeous website that we have enough. It, who's responsible for the website, by the way? Well, I don't want to. Don't even tell me. But it, it's a disaster, Mike. Really? Someone has actually paid get... money to supervise that. Oh, that that website is is awful. The city's website. City website. Yes. City website. Okay. It's uh, tr try to find city council videos. Try to f try to find um, city council committees. Yeah. Try to find city councilors. I mean, I, no, that's just one aspect. Hope that's not intentional. Well, it, whatever. <laughs> one I wonders. Mean, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. But it's. I mean, but but this is information that the public wants to wants to know. Okay. They, they, they want to have access to it. I guess I, I don't have any problem navigating through the city's website. But I, I use it every single day, mm -hmm. so maybe I'm just. I did pay to it. for my dog license and renew my dog license online today, um, but it did take a while. I went to Vital Records first, and then it brought me to a page that had a menu where I could actually click on dog licenses. <laughs> oh, and if I could just a plug for the clerk, she's going to for parking permits now. She's she's going to implement. She's going to take those over, and it's not official yet, but we'll we'll vote on it next week, two weeks from now. And then um, those will be online as well. So that'll be kind of nice. I do know for the city's we website, would, each department is oh, responsible for the content on their individual speaking, page. I was looking so as far as DPW it's goes, it's up to the DPW to maintain the, the content. Uh, whenever we change the hours for the yard waste pile or the, uh, it, it's up to us to make those changes. And also, we have to uh, post all of our own table. meeting agendas on the website. Yeah, and you actually, your 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 minutes from the public works right. and yeah. authorities are um, greatly improved. Yeah, they they're pretty comprehensive, especially relative to how they used to be. So thank you. But and Brian, yours are always good, and your Terry, yours are always good. So keep keep going. They're, they're comprehensive. I appreciate that. So, motion to table. Thank you so much. For Thanks for coming down this evening. Um, the motion to table is there a second? Second. So, uh, all in favor? All right. All right. Uh, motion to take up number five. Second. Motion has been made and seconded. All in favor? All right. Um, item five is filed by Councilor Jordan that the ordinances related to ancillary structures be reviewed for possible revisions, particularly as it relates to garages. We did get a um, letter from our building commissioner, Damian Cody, um, with some information to help guide our um, ordinance process. Um, so I'll just read it. It's pretty brief. I'll read it. You, in. Don't, you don't have to read it. You don't want me to read it in? No. Please dispense with the reading. Okay. Um, I'll take this under advisement. I mean, this has been cooking here for seven months already. Um, just to refresh everyone's memory, why this is a radioactive issue and needs to be resolved once and for all is if you go to the corner of Locust and, and, and um, Mackenzie Avenue and look at the new garage that went up, all the residents are up in arms about it. Um, it's a monstrosity. It looks like it's the same size as the house and they just basically what appears to be like consuming the entire backyard. And moreover, um, you've got people that are driving over the sidewalk, no curb cut. How the heck do you get a garage to drive into the garage when you don't even have a permit to get a curb cut? So you're, the, the, the owner is currently driving over the sidewalk and apparently that's legal. Uh, that's no, insane to me. 
So, so but it's happening every day. And um, now there's other allegations going on about, you know, work being done at the house and that's not, there's no permits for any of this and working on cars or having a, these are various other businesses. But let's put, and I have photos, uh, there's all kinds of photos. It's probably the most photographed house in Holyoke right now. It's probably got more photos of it than Kenilworth Castle at this point had. So um, at, this, at this point, my point, I just took it real simple. At the very base level, what can do I know is illegal? Driving over the sidewalk. You are not allowed to do that. You have to have a curb cut. We have ordinances. I pointed this out to the police. I said, forget everything else. Just enforce that. And um, I'm but, told, hmm, very interesting observation, counselor. Yes, yes. Uh, we'll look into that. Mr. President? Yes. If I may, just on the curb cut, has that just... Has that been addressed yet, or is that still an ongoing issue? I don't even think the owner has even applied for one. Okay, so, may, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, so that exact same issue happened with a property on Hitchcock Street, specifically 20 Hitchcock Street, and I had constituents. Um, so I, I contacted Mr. McManus. Yep. Now, it, it, it took a little bit of time, but he sent a letter so he's got, he's got the draft letter already set. He just has to change the address. He copied it to the various departments, including HPD. Yep. But he mailed a letter to the resident. Now the resident has since come back to apply for a curb cut. So th that process is now ongoing with the Board of Public Works. So that could be... Well, what if they deny it? Let's just say, no. We say no to the curb cut. Then where, where are we at with this garage? Well, you can't access it with a with a vehicle. That's that's that. That's what I would say. Boy, that's a that's an interesting proposition. My point is, how does something like this get that far along? Thank you. That you don't even have permission. Seems like the most obvious is, can you even make that into a driveway? Let's start with. Can, do I even have permission to make a driveway before I make the garage to go to the driveway? There, there you go, Mr. President. So that's 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 seems like the owner is taking an awful risk. Yeah, that, that's point. that's on the owner. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Well, the use right, the use of that structure as a garage is a decision that the owner is making. Our ordinances don't outline the requirements for garages; they just yep. say ancillary structures. So you could build things like this on your property. You just yes. can't use it as a garage and drive over the city's sidewalk exactly. to get your car in there. Exactly. No, you're exactly right. So he could use it for storage or whatever, um, if ultimately. So this will help address some level of reasonability to garages that you have literally garages the size of, other, of, the, of the main home, it would appear. And we should revisit like what percentage of your lot can you make into structures? He yeah, I know. Yeah, Damien, I haven't even read this. I'm just seeing this for the first time. So, so I'm going to ask that this all be tabled. Table. Yeah, but my point is oh. that's where this is all going. So thank you, Damien, for getting us this. So motion to table. Motion has been made and seconded to table. All in favor? Uh, Aye. I, motion to take it number seven. Uh, seven and gonna... eight can actually, oh no, seven's different, sorry. A uh, second to his motion. Motion to take up item number seven. All in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have a draft here? Is that it? No. I don't think we have a draft here, I'm sorry to say. So I'm going to say that um, this should remain on the table. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to um, keep item number seven on the table. Return it to the table. All in favor? Aye. Motion to take it number eight. Well, we, why don't we take eight, nine, and ten up as a package? Because it's all, I'm going to. So moved. Second. Um, motion is made, made and seconded to take eight, nine, and ten up as a package. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. So we received tonight the draft ordinances for eight, nine, and ten. I would like to review those. And then if we could table it for this meeting and maybe in a couple weeks we could revisit this. Sure. Um, so I'd ask to second. table them again. Motion has been made and seconded to table items uh, 8, 9, and 10. All in favor? Aye. So Motion moved. to adjourn. Motion has been made to adjourn. It's second. not debatable. All in, all in favor? Aye. Let's go. Thank you so much. Thank you.
effects, but I didn't see her flowers, so unfortunately.